I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. The Transparency Task Force is a certified social enterprise, which means that we exist to make an impact and not to make a profit. The area in which we seek to make an impact is financial services. We believe that the financial services sector is profoundly important to the well-being of society, to economic stability, and also to political stability as well. However, we also believe that it is a sector that has a, I'm gonna put it very politely, a predisposition to misbehave if it is allowed to. And frankly, all the evidence shows that the financial services sector will and does misbehave at pretty much every opportunity it seems to get. And that's a huge concern for us because we cannot have a financial industry which is serving society properly if it carries on misbehaving. Now, some of you will be familiar with Violation Tracker UK. Just in case there are some on the session who aren't, I'm going to show you some information that really will put what I've just said into context for you. So here it is. This is Violation Tracker UK. It is essentially a, a, a database of all the violations against the US, uh, sorry, the UK authorities going back to the year 2010. The way that it works is very simple. Uh, there's a long list of agencies here, including the Financial Conduct Authority, that provide public domain information about violations against them. And what the database does is it basically brings them all together and makes it available in a very easy to search way. One of the most powerful searches we can do, folks, is when we click on, um, we go to other summaries, we go to parent industry totals, and what that does is it takes us to a table of the 46 industries within the database, 46 industries within the database. Now, I am absolutely convinced that it is wholly inappropriate for the financial industry to be anywhere near the top. I say that because the financial sector can only function successfully if it is trustworthy. So on that basis, given the trust dependency of the financial industry, there is no way that the regulators, the government, the industry, the market participants, the trade bodies, the professional associations, should allow the financial services sector to behave in an irresponsible way that causes reputational damage. But ladies and gentlemen, not only is the financial services sector towards the top of this very long list of industries, it is actually the top. It is the single worst offending industry. And this is data going back 10 years. Not only is it the top, it's the top by such a long way that if you add up the total of all the other industries, in other words, aerospace, telecoms, utilities, diversified pharmaceuticals, if you go all the way to the bottom and add up all the infringements that they have had, and you compare it to the financial services industry on its own, it's roughly the same, roughly the same. And that clearly points to a major systemic problem because there's no way the financial services sector should be uh, carrying out such malpractice, mal malfeasance, misconduct and mis-selling to warrant it equating to roughly one pound in every two pounds of the fines in the UK over the last 10, 11 years. You've got a list of the worst offenders here, NatWest, Barclays, Lloyds, UBS, JP Morgan Chase, Deutsche, Credit Suisse, HSBC, Citigroup and Standard Chartered. And then you've got the individual offences ranked by how large the fine was. Ranked by how large the fine was. So we've got Credit Suisse at the top of that, an enormous fine of £292,209,276. And then you've got this very, very long list of other offending entities, banks. Now, if I was the person responsible for conduct in the banking sector, I absolutely would be doing all I could to understand what on earth is going on here. Because clearly, 
the banking sector is misbehaving. And by the way, you might say to yourself, well, surely this is historical stuff to do with the global financial crisis. Well, let me show you this. If you click on the year column, it first of all gives you the oldest cases first. If you click on it once again, it gives you the most recent cases first. Mastercard 2022, NatWest 2021, HSBC 2021. Look at all these recent, recent cases. So the idea that once upon a time, the banking sector used to misbehave and but doesn't do it anymore, that ladies and gentlemen is complete rubbish. The evidence proves otherwise. And not only that, when you go down this list, you find a really worrying pattern. The same organizations are being caught doing the same things over and over and over again. And that's called recidivism. Now, recidivism is an enormous worry because if recidivism is the same organizations doing the same things over and over again, not only does it put a great big question mark over the integrity of the banks and the malpractice and malfeasance and misconduct and mis-selling and fraud and all the rest of it, it must also put perhaps even a bigger question mark over the efficacy of the regulatory framework because the regulatory approach is clearly failing. If the purpose of regulation is to help ensure we have a healthy, credible, high integrity, well-stewarded financial sector, what, what I'm showing you here, ladies and gentlemen, is proof positive that the regulators are failing. And many, many, many people believe that a big part of this problem is that all that's happening here is this. The banks do something wrong. They make a huge amount of money whilst doing something wrong. They get caught. They get fined. The shareholders pay the fine. The individuals at the top of the organisations responsible for whatever it is that was going on don't get fined. There's a complete lack of personal jeopardy. They get away scot-free. They may well have profited from, uh, from the consequence of in increases to the share price. That may impact their bonus pool. Uh, and then the problem just repeats itself. People have been telling me for years that within the banking sector, getting caught and getting fined is just a cost of doing business. And that's unacceptable because we therefore would have a banking sector that is predisposed to carry on doing the sorts of things that have caused carnage around the world by way of the global financial crisis. And as you'll be hearing today, uh, extreme human cost and suffering for some individuals who've ended up becoming the scapegoats of the malpractice and worse of the people running these organizations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I genuinely believe this is perhaps the most important transparency task force symposium we have ever done because we are going to be working hard to try to bring justice where justice needs to get to. There are people you'll be hearing from today who've literally been investigated, prosecuted and put in jail who should not have been. End of. And if you doubt that, listen, please listen to the lowball tapes from the Andy Verity BBC Radio 4 programme. If you have any doubt in your mind that the wrong people have been investigated and prosecuted, listen to those tapes. And also, I would strongly suggest to you that there were a number of senior figures in the Bank of England, in the banks, in the Treasury, in the government, and even in the regulators, who at the very, very best turned a blind eye to what was going on, at worst behaved in a manner that was wholly unethical, wholly unprofessional, very low levels of integrity, and arguably illegal criminal. There are several people that I personally think, having listened to the Lobel Tapes podcast, there are several people that haven't even been investigated that I personally think should have been investigated. And it wouldn't surprise me if a thorough investigation of their work and their activities was to result in them actually um, having to go and spend some time um, behind bars. And I'm happy to go on record saying that I think the, long, the wrong people have been locked up 
and we ought to all be very, very angry about this. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can't get angry about the fact that innocent people went to jail and guilty people didn't, then what on earth is it going to take for us to get angry about? I'm going to share my screen once more before passing over to our uh, to our first speaker, Kevin Holland Rake -Kev MP. So this is the part of the web page we produced. I'm just going to read out some of the words on it directly from the lowball tapes. If you haven't listened to the podcast, you really, really must. Um, so here we go. So there's a part in the in a, in a in, in BBC coverage where these quotes are written. The link to the coverage is in the web page. I'm going to read this out to you and please take in every single word. These words are significant. Perhaps one of the most important sentences in the whole series is the comment made by Mark Garnier MP, former member of the Treasury Select Committee, which has previously investigated libel rigging, but were not given, or in brackets, or perhaps that they should be, they were denied from having, all the evidence that was available at the time. In response to a question Andy Verity puts to him about what he thinks should happen next, Mark Garnier MP's response is, if I was chairman of the Treasury Committee now, then I would be inclined to have a hearing to go into all of this and find out more about it. Similarly, former MP and also former member of the Treasury Committee, Theresa Pierce says in the programme, I think it needs to be reopened and I'd like fresh eyes to look at this. And here's BBC News coverage about the podcast series and the calls for reform. Here's a snippet from that coverage. The call for a fresh investigation is supported by three other former and current members of the Treasury Committee. It needs a new, full, judge-led inquiry. I'm going to repeat that. It needs a new, full, judge-led inquiry, said Treasury Committee member and campaigner against financial corruption, Kevin Hoddenrake. MP. You cannot have a situation where the rule setters, the masters of the universe, go by one set of rules and the rest of us go by another. I don't care who those people are, what level of government, what level of the Bank of England, or what level of the FCA, or what level of the banks they're working in. These people have to play by the rules. So there should be an inquiry and investigation to see if they have. Those are absolutely fantastic words spoken and captured in the media by our first speaker, Kevin Hoddenrake MP. Those of you who are uh, familiar with the TTF and our work will know that Kevin Hoddenrake MP has been an absolute superstar in terms of helping to shine a light where the light needs to shine. Um, he's the uh, co-chair of the all party parliamentary group on fair business <clears throat> banking, which as I'm sure you must know, is actually um, <coughs> taking the FCA to court by way of a ju uh, judicial review in relation to interest rate hed hedging product mis-selling. And he's also um, on the Treasury Select Committee now. Kevin Hodderate, once again, we are really, really pleased you're with us today. So uh, over to you, Kevin, please to share with us your thoughts about the, uh, the lowball tapes and any related matters that you'd like to speak to. Thank you very much, Kevin. Cheers. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Andy. Thanks for putting this on and welcome everybody. And um, I mean, also thanks to Andy Verity, as well as the work we do in Parliament. And there are many, many people that are concerned about this stuff, all the stuff Andy outlined in his opening remarks in Parliament. Um, but also people at like Andy Verity and um, James Hurley at the Times, many others who constantly draw attention to this stuff. We couldn't do our work without them. They do a tremendous job in highlighting this stuff, um, not just in terms of their ability to get stuff on, on screen and in the papers, but also in terms of the research they put in. They put an awful lot of work in to, this, to these issues. Um, now, I mean, another example to me of, of what I would describe, I often describe as uh, financial feudalism. It's, it's really... As Andy said, um, referred to my quote I gave to to An uh, Andy Verity for his piece in the, on the BBC. Um, you know, financial feudalism is basically there is one rule for us, one rule for the, what you might describe as the masters of the universe. Is that of course they, these were two separate things. Um, Tom Hayes and others. Uh, I think Tom's on the call, and uh, you know he came across very well. I thought in 
and these fantastic low balling tapes, which is very compelling. But um, he was doing something that was commonplace. It wasn't, um, it was only kind of uh, made somehow illegal during the course of the court case. Um, but he was just doing something that was in common practice across all the banks in terms of trying to set a rate for the interest rates at their LIBOR that was um, advantageous to the commercial interest of the bank. Um, but all those rates were genuine rates. Um, of course, what happened during the financial crisis is, um, I don't, let, let's be fair about this, you know, the financial crisis, I think the whole world was just, um, you know, it's a huge sharp intake of breath. Um, you're waiting for, for a resolution to that financial crisis. And if you're in business, you just wanted the thing solved. And lots of people were going around trying to work out how to navigate through a financial crisis that was potentially going to cause uh, even greater problems than actually caused. Um, so they were trying to uh, have a fix for uh, the, um, the pressure that the banks were under and trying to get us through a very tricky period. But that doesn't mean you can break the rules. The rules are the rules and everybody's got to live by them. That's the key. But I, as Andy said, I describe as the masters of the universe. Think at that point in time, they can step in and do whatever they want and break those rules. And that seems to be the senior leadership of the banks. But also, they can't do that without the regulator and potentially without uh, the assistance of some people in the Treasury. And we see this time and time again, um, that the rules can be set aside for people at that level. Uh, it doesn't apply to them. That cannot be, that, be right. That's not consistent with democracy, the rule of law, the fundamentals of our society. Everybody's got to play by the same rules. And they, of course, in this, they didn't. I won't go into this case in detail. Others will do that better than I can. But the fact that some of the whistleblowers in this went to jail for this is just absolutely incredible. Um, so, but I'll say it's incredible because it's not actually incredible because we see this kind of stuff happening all the time. And the parallels I would give with this particular case, uh, there's a number of parallels. Um, uh, the RBS, uh, GRG, Global Restructuring Group, you know, it's quite clear from, ev from documented evidence that's been through the courts that the Asset Protection Agency, which was a division of the Treasury, sought to influence RBS to actually make sure they did take away lending and take away assets from businesses. Um, and that was clearly reported in the, uh, in the FCA commission report done by Promontory. It was supposed to lead to individuals being sanctioned within RBS uh, that, and that stage never happened. And that was effectively pulled in by the, by the FCA when Andrew Bailey was head of the FCA. So there are a number of parallels here, which when th things get, People at the top think they can just change the rules, influence the system however they want, the rules, they are not subject to the rules, and in, in many ways are complicit to the covering up of information. Um, again, if you look at Lloyd's Banking Group, they take over HBOS, HBOS Reading, um, Sally Masterton, the whistleblower in that case in 2013, she exposed what's happening in terms of a fraud within that bank, which is pretty systemic. And... Um, some low-level bankers eventually went to jail. The Sally Masterton was disc discredited for five years. Um, whistleblower in that case, discredited for five years by Lloyds, who said she wasn't acting in uh, on the instructions of the bank. For, uh, five years later, they absolutely apologised to her and said that she was, and that what she'd done was uh, was requested by her superior. Um, they compensated her. That was four years ago now. And nobody in Lloyd's has been sanctioned under the senior manager regime by the FCA for that five-year discrediting of a whistleblower. It's, it's outrageous. And, um, and as Andy says, of course, the, if the regulator takes that view, then the people within the banks take that view too, that they're pretty much untouchable. They're the untouchables. And therefore, yes, a fine here and there might, well, might be sound quite a lot of money, but it doesn't affect the people who... Uh, who are guilty of the mis, uh, misconduct at the time, uh, they're long gone and send their bonuses with them, of course. So, um, so yeah, a number of other examples of this, with PPI, of course, and you mentioned the uh, IOHP, uh, uh, the, uh, the scandal of mis-selling to SMEs, um, where the FCA was clearly influenced by the banks and potentially by uh, individual, individuals within the Treasury, um, not to open that scheme to all businesses who suffered mis-selling um, from, by the 
by the banks and, and the regulator works hand in hand and lets the banks get away with it yet again and no individuals are sanctioned. Um, and again, whistleblowers play the key part in all that. So, um, so we need a different system. And we need to improve the system we've got, should I say, and I think that's the best way forward. Um, a number of things we're trying to do in Parliament to do that. A, we, as Andy says, our all parts group is trying, is, is trying to take forward a judicial review of the SCA's decision on swaps um, to, to, so the SCA will know it cannot do, cannot work in isolation, can't do just what it thinks it can do. It will, it is accountable to Parliament and parliamentarians as it should be. Um, but also we need some bigger systemic things. I, I do think a, a judicial inquiry would be the right thing to do in terms of the lowballing a scandal, but I also think there should be a wider uh, uh, review of all this. Some something like the Royal Commission that in Australia, a full public inquiry into the very system of our financial services companies, many of which do a fantastic job and are instrumental to our economy. But therefore, all the more reason they should live, they should be properly regulated, and that's a concern many of us have. Um, the regulator is pretty light touch and and rather just smooth things over than hold people to account, which I think is is a false economy in terms of regulatory uh, regulatory system. So a, a royal commission, public inquiry into the whole um, sector. When that happened in Australia, we saw seven uh, chief execs, chair chairs of organisations resign as, as a consequence of that. Some of the some of the practices that were um, uncovered through that inquiry. Um, that would be the right thing to do. The economic crime bill we've got coming forward, hugely important. We've had one, uh, that part one of that, part two of that. The key measure I would like to see in that is protection and compensation of whistleblowers. They're absolutely critical to everything that goes on in this. And there's a number of people on this call who've been whistleblowers who have done absolutely vital work in exposing the wrongdoing that we see in our financial services sector. If we get that right, it will be much easier for us to hold the banks and bankers to account. Um, and also, we, we, we believe we should have a financial services tribunal along similar lines to employment tribunal. There are 30 million people in employment in the UK. I bet nobody can name the regulator, the employment regulator. And that's because there isn't one. There's no employment regulator. What you have in employment law is you simply have a tribunal. So if you've been, you feel you have been mistreated by your employer, you then um, can take your case into to court, is what you can do, which is open court, it's tribunal. So banks and bankers potentially through this route might be subject to public proceedings. So their, their um, misconduct, their illegality, whatever else it is, can, um, can be exposed properly in a, in a public forum. And, and the key thing with the employment tribunal, there is no, no adverse costs. So whatever banks want to spend on defending the, that prosecution um, or that claim can't be, uh, can't be attributable to the, the claimant. So um, that's the thing we've been calling for for some time. We think that'd be a far more effective system of regulation than the current one we've got, which is simply, uh, say, too light touch and doesn't get under, doesn't bring people to account but um so lots of work going on lots more to do and um and so sessions like this uh, are hugely important in uh, in shining a light on some of the things that we're getting wrong in the sector and i applaud your work andy oh kevin um we we applaud your work it's absolutely fantastic we have somebody who's uh, right of center and also so committed to uh, to to you know transparency accountability uh, trustworthiness in the financial industry and it's it's very obvious to all of us Kevin that when you work you really do work with a, a tremendous degree of commitment and determination we know that the judicial review is taking up a huge amount of time and effort and if and it really could be a a landmark watershed moment if the FCA were to be successfully challenged in court and basically brought to to heel uh, so they started behaving for the, the way that they ought to we, we have enormous admiration for the work that you do Kevin we we really, really do. Thank you. Um, quick, quick question, Kevin. In terms of in terms of parliamentary procedures, what would be the right way for folks like us to kind of request that the Treasury Select Committee ought to think about a, a, a hearing or an inquiry about what happened with all the stuff covered so brilliantly by Andy Verity and others on the Lobel Tapes uh, podcast series? How should we go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, the Treasury Select Committee, you know, 
you know, it, it will decide for itself what it will look into. So in terms of what you can do to raise attention to this is certainly write to the Treasury Select Committee and all its members and, and suggest that this is something that happens and you hope somebody's going to going to take that up. I've already talked to the chair about it and uh, I very much hope that this uh, the Treasury Select Committee does look at it and um, and write a uh, report into it because I think it's, um, it's you know, this, this subject is hugely important. Thank you, Kevin. We, we will make available the recording of this entire session to all the members of the Treasury Select Committee. It might just help them make a decision about whether this is a matter that they ought to uh, take a look at. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that, Kevin. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any, any quick comments or questions for Kevin? I know he's on a pretty tight deadline today. He needs to disappear quite short, shortly. Sorry, shortly? Shortly. Um, but if anybody has anything they're itching to ask Kevin, please wave a hand at me, either digitally or otherwise. Um, okay, it looks like we're all good, which is great. We'll be going to Matt Connolly next. But before we do that, let us please show our most sincere appreciation to Kevin Hollenrake and all that he's doing, not just in relation to the judicial review, but everything else as well. Kevin, thank you very, very much indeed. Superb, absolutely superb. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Great. Okay, 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 okay. Mr. Matt Connolly, please take the opportunity, sir, to introduce yourself, tell everybody where you are, how you got involved in all this, what happened to you as succinctly as you can. But perhaps most importantly, Matt, what do you think needs to happen next? That's the real question today. What do you think needs to happen next, Matt? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Connolly, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I worked at uh, Deutsche Bank until voluntarily leaving in 2008 in disgust of the banking industry. Um, I worked in New York. Uh, I live in New Jersey now. Um, eight years after I left the business, uh, I was charged in 2016 for LIBOR manipulation. Uh, went to trial in 2018. Uh, and was convicted. And just two months ago, the Second Circuit of uh, New York Appeal Board uh, acquitted me fully in roundabout terms saying that I never, never broke any rules and was driving 35 miles an hour in a, with a 50 mile an hour speed limit. So, that's where we are now. Um, then we're going to go back and we're going to, I'll talk a little bit about how I got here. And there's a lot of, a lot of mud to be thrown to the U S government, the banks, Deutsche Bank and the FCA. Um, I'm going to talk more about the FCA today, um, about, about what happened with them during my case. Um, now, in, in every US federal trial, the defense lawyers keep um, a spreadsheet of prosecutor misconduct. And at the end of the case, they put in a, a motion to let the judge and the court and everybody else know uh, the, the instances of misconduct that came up during the case. Uh, my prosecutor misconduct motion, which is on my website, um, is 86 pages long, which I heard is one of the longest ones out there. And the FCA has their own little section of that prosecutor misconduct uh, motion, which we're going to talk about uh, a little bit now. So the, the, there's three instances I want to talk about. There's, there could be more, but I, I want to keep it simple. Um, but in the past few months, uh, I've been shown evidence that during the financial crisis in 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008, the FSA, which was the precursor to the FCA, was kept in the loop of all the LIBOR issues going on, which included uh, the fact that there were no re uh, readily available rates, no lending to, to make a LIBOR assumption on. Uh, there was uh, lowballing, you know, there was multiple different 
issues uh, by government and the BBA to manipulate LIBOR. Uh, and I've just been shown in the past few months that the FSA was kept in the loop during that process. So now let's fast forward five years to when Deutsche Bank settled with uh, the US and the UK governments, including the FCA. Uh, we uncovered evidence that despite knowing that the conduct that I was prosecuted on was bank policy um, given down from senior executives at Deutsche Bank, we found evidence that um, the week before Deutsche Bank was going to settle, they would not settle and they would not pay the fine unless the senior executives were deleted from the uh, statement of facts or the reports from the government. So basically they agreed to pay the FCA a bigger fine, 227 million pounds, if the senior executives responsible for the policy were deleted out of the final settlement, which basically allowed them not to come under scrutiny. So we, we found that out, that came up in the pre-trial and the trial phase of our case. Um, and despite being absolutely outrageous that that was allowed to happen, the, the fact of the matter is um, it goes on in the United States all the time and it goes on in the UK all the time when, especially when banks negotiate with the regulators because the regulators want the fine money because they are able to pay themselves bonuses from that fine money. They can go to the media and say that they're big heroes for this great investigation um, by putting those numbers in front of everybody. Um, now the last, the last thing regarding the FCA came up uh, in court um, during uh, pre-trial and trial uh, hearings in front of the judge. Um, there was a constitutional issue going on uh, which regarded the how the uh, the differences in how a US investigation is allowed to be brought versus a UK investigation. So as part of that hearing, um, members of the Financial uh, Conduct Authority in the UK um, had to sign declarations about how the investigation was carried out. Um, during the hearing, it came out that there were two false declarations uh, signed by Patrick Meany, who was in charge of the FCA investigation, um, his uh, staff members came into court and admitted that, that how the investigation proceeded was uh, against US law um, and that he signed false declarations knowing they were false because they weren't minor technicalities. They were questions such as, did you send this report to the prosecutors in the US? Did you share this information? Did you show them compelled testimony from the UK? So they weren't minor technicalities that he you know, decided uh, you know, to, to lie about. They were, you know, important issues as far as the U.S. Constitution goes. Um, and, and that all came out in the pre-trial and trial period. Um, and the outrageous part of the whole thing, because it's all on the record in the court, in the trial record, um, it's all there. The outrageous part of the whole thing is the consequences for him for doing that was getting a similar job 
in Asia doing the same things so that he could go there and torture innocent people further in Asia. That was his consequences for doing what he did to prosecute us in the US. And as I've said all along, you know, we obviously know with the, with the lowball tapes that there was a cover up going on, you know, and that was part of the process of, uh, of making sure nobody knew what really happened here. Um, and there was, you know, 40 of us, you know, mid to low level traders that ended up being a very, a very easy distraction to get the general public angry out and to get their blood and get their scalps. Um, so the, the final thing I want to leave you with is that when the people from the FCA were signing false declarations, lying to the court, um, having to send letters of apologies and restate everything, uh, Andrew Bailey was in charge of the FCA while all that was happening. So I just want, I'll leave it there and I'll answer any questions anybody has. Matt, thank you very much indeed. That really is remarkably, remarkably powerful testimony. Um, you, you have to kind of stop and think about what you're actually hearing. Here we are, here we are listening, direct evidence from somebody who absolutely knew what was going on, talking about what must amount to egregious breaches of the Nolan principles, the principles of conduct in public office. Uh, this is this is amazing testimony, Matt. It really, it really is. We've got uh, Mark Bishop's put his hand up and then Paul Carlier. Mark, if you wouldn't mind, just very, very briefly introduce yourself uh, and then we'll go to Paul. Thank you. So my name is Mark Bishop. I came to, into financial services campaign about a decade ago uh, because I was one of the victims of the Economic Income Fund Series 1. Um, I was led from that into uh, trying to help other victims of regulatory failure, which Connaught certainly was, and worse. Um, and from that into a couple of years ago, perhaps a bit more, uh, working with Andean Transparency Task Force. And I'm now kind of, in effect, kind of voluntary um, kind of head of uh, what you call it strategy and public affairs. So I do a lot of uh, work on consultation with responses, uh, talking to politicians, those kinds of things. Um, but I do actually have um, what might be a useful piece of information to add into uh, the debate raised by Matt's comments. Uh, one of the things that Matt uh, alleged, and I'm sure I know he's got evidence for this, um, is that uh, the FCA did a, a dodgy deal with Deutsche Bank, whereby the seniors were excluded from uh, the kind of metaphorical charge sheet, and in return, the bank appeared to pay a much larger fine. Now, you notice I used the words appeared to pay, and I believe that there may be some reason to doubt whether the money was paid, or rather more specifically, because I'm sure it was paid, whether it was actually retained. Now, bear with me, and I'll explain to you why I say this. Many of you know that a few years ago, the FCA moved from its premises in North Colonnade uh, in um, Canary Wharf uh, to the Olympic Park in uh, Stratford, a very significantly inferior location. And not only that, but its new offices are a very long way indeed from the tube. You have to navigate an underground car park to get to it. Um, there is such a high rate of crime, particularly muggings there, that the FCA has to employ guards that stand along the route to protect its employees. It is that defective a location. Uh, it has also been alleged that the FCA is paying far too high a rent for the premises, uh, that it has on a very long and inflexible lease, um, that it rented far too much space, much more than it needed. Pretty much the entire third floor is given over to a, a fitness suite, which includes even um, an aromatherapy area. Um, now, why am I mentioning all of this? Oh, the other thing I should say is they also rented it completely not fitted out and they bore the cost to fit out themselves. I think that was uh, 95 million from memory. Um, and why do I mention this? Simply because there's an amazing coincidence about who the freeholder is. 
Yep, Deutsche Bank. So could it be that the FCA would have entered into a very bad lease arrangement, the effect of which would be covertly to hand back the, appear, the, appear, the uh, apparent fine that they uh, imposed on Deutsche Bank? Uh, I'm not able to prove this. You know, it may just be that Andrew Bailey is very bad at commercial negotiations and he struck a particularly poor deal with the landlord. And it's only a coincidence that the landlord is a large regulated firm that had just paid a very large fine. But I have to say, it doesn't look like it to me. Well, thank you very much indeed for posing that uh, very, very interesting line of thought. Let's uh, dig around and see what we can come up with. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Carlier, please brief introduction and then go to your point. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Paul Carlier, uh, two-time bank whistleblower with uh, UBS and Lloyd's. Um, I'd just like to, obviously, I know a lot about Matt's case and huge congratulations uh, are due. Um, I'd just like to ask Matt about his thoughts of the BBA um, and, you know, and, and their role. Well, it's interesting. The lowball tapes brought out conduct from the BBA that even I was unaware of. Um, the Bank of England during the financial crisis nationalized a few banks, so wanted to prop their share prices up. One of the ways they did that was by lowballing, because not showing the real price that the banks had to pay for cash um, was able to help prop up their share price, which would help get the UK government back their investments. Okay. Now the BBA in April of uh, 2008, the Wall Street Journal put out an article um, shedding doubt on the whole LIBOR process. Um, the problem with that for the BBA was that they were making millions in dollars in licensing fee, fees every year. It was a big profit center from the futures exchanges and, and all the other people who had to pay licensing fees. So they went against the Bank of England's wishes and colluded with all the panel banks in mid-April to move LIBOR you know, 20 or 25 basis points higher to, to bring back credibility to the product so that they wouldn't lose their licensing fees. And all that activity back and forth between the Bank of England and the New York Federal Reserve, by the way, and the BBA was 400 times the magnitude of my three emails that I was charged with over, over $7,800. Uh, so it's, you know, what was happening here is, you know, as plain as the nose of my face or the forehead on my face, and I have a big forehead. So it's pretty plain what was happening here. Thank and the you. BBA uh, knew exactly what they were doing. Um, thank you very much indeed. It is impossible, folks, to listen to the lowball tapes without coming out of it, with, without thinking to yourself, hmm, interesting conduct there by the BBA. What really was going on behind the scenes? Uh, I know I'm repeating myself, folks. If you haven't yet listened to lowball tapes, you really, you really, really must. Does anybody have uh, any other comments or questions for Matt before we pass on to our next speaker? OK, in which case, can we please show our appreciation and, and congratulate Matt for getting closer and closer and closer to the justice that he deserves. Matt, thank you very, very much indeed for being with thank us. Thank you. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Andy. Thank you, everyone else. Thank you. We're going to do all we possibly can to uh, shine a light on the on what's been going on. We're now going to go straight over to Jay. Jay, please take the opportunity to introduce yourself, uh, give us a bit of context and share with us what you'd like to say, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Jay Merchant. Um, I was a trader at Barclays London from uh, 1998 until 2004, after which I moved to Barclays New York 
from 2004 uh, until um, 2008. And then, oh, sorry, no, until 2009. And then I moved to another bank uh, to work somewhere else. Uh, the conduct in question, or I was um, charged for uh, libel communication during my time in New York uh, by the FCA and uh, the SFO. Um, uh, not during, not for any conduct in the UK, even though I told the regulators that this procedure existed from the day I joined, I was called a liar and they said no such documentation existed, which is complete nonsense. Uh, my thoughts, um, oh, so, so to finish, uh, I finally went to trial in 2016 in the UK and was convicted and uh, I served uh, two years in a bit in the UK and uh, after which I denounced my UK citizenship and left because I could no longer be uh, in a place where people in power could resort to such tactics to uh, uh, frame innocent people. Uh, my thoughts on the LIBOR investigation um, can be expressed through two docs. Uh, the first is a letter a friend of mine, Simon Holmes, wrote to the um, to the Treasury Select Committee on December 12, 2017. Simon worked at Barclays. He's not a lawyer by any means. He's just a money manager at a big firm now, uh, but he's well aware of the pr procedures and processes of LIBOR in general. And that date is significant because it was the date before David Green, the then head of SFO, was gonna testify in front of uh, Parliament. So Simon wrote this letter expressing the many wrongdoings and issues that had happened with disclosure with Barclays and with the SFO to the Justice Committee and the Treasury Select, Select Committee uh, the day before Mr. Green testified. But sadly, uh, uh, nothing happened in the testimony. Uh, I think Mr. Green actually got knighted and then went to work for a firm which was instrumental in hiding a lot of the disclosure in Tom Hayes' trial and hurt us and made him and the rest of us guilty. So make what you want may about that salary or income he gained from the very firm that benefited from Tom and the rest of ours incarceration. The second doc I wrote the day I left prison in August, 2018, summarizing the various misdeeds of Barclays as well as the regulator. This letter, what I was hoping to do with this letter was to have a reputable newspaper or somebody publish it. It wasn't that long because there were dozens, maybe hundreds of people who were wanted to speak up and were aware of the wrongdoings and wanted to whistleblow, but were scared because of the negative publicity or losing their jobs. So I was hoping for kind of like a hashtag me too. There would be some kind of anonymous way they could deposit maybe in, in a drop box or something like that. Unfortunately, uh, Andy was aware, Verity was aware of this letter um, um, when I wrote it, but none of the UK journalists at the time seemed very hot. Uh, because at that time it was still better or easier to he hate a banker as opposed to hate the regulator, so to speak. Um, I'm happy to say that a lot of the things we wrote at the time are now coming to fruition and are being exposed. But there are many more things in there that are still to be exposed and will shock you. And I'm happy to share both those documents with anybody who wants. Um, I think the biggest problem with the LIBOR investigation, and I guess in regulators in general, is nobody is regulating the FCA or the SFO. They are able to operate with the impunity of somebody who's above the law. And some of the things that they do, none of you would ever think about doing. They do it on an everyday basis because they're immoral, unethical, and in some cases illegal. But yet they continue to do it every single day. My opinion is at the very least, the SFO and the FCA were criminally negligent in handling of this case. At the very worst, they colluded with senior bankers to per perpetuate a regulatory fraud. I'll give you a good example of, of this. The SFO and the SCA were supposed to uncover the truth and give, give you all the possible ways to find out the truth. In my case, or in our case, that couldn't be further from the truth. There are thousands of documents and phone calls that prove what me and several of the other traders are saying is true. 
but none of that was ever allowed to be exposed in our case. We had three witnesses from Barclays, my three immediate supervisors, Harry Harrison, Eric Bomansart, and Michael Bagley. All their compensation came from the profit and loss of derivatives traders. These same traders who were accused of committing this horrible crime. Even though I have not made a penny out of LIBOR, as proven in the case, the, the prosecution, the FCO went to great lengths to say how I made a million dollars a year or whatever it was, over a million dollars a year. Yet we were denied to show that during the same six year indictment period, my three bosses were paid over $290 million. What? And since that time, they've been paid millions more in golden handshakes and promotions. So why would the FCA and SFO stop us from using this information and yet say I made a seven figure salary when it had nothing to do with LIBOR? How can any honest regulator want to keep that from us? Yet it was during the entire trial. Jay, forgive me interrupting you. Jay, forgive me interrupting yeah. you. Just yeah. for the record, did you say $290 million? And I, I have a document to show it. Sorry, forgive me interrupting you. I just can't. I just, it's astonishing. Uh, further for the same point, during my six year indictment period, the FCA or Barclays, we don't know if the FCA and the SFO took Barclays information or they combined with them to hide information. That I don't know. But there were maybe almost 40 to 50,000 documents, phone calls with keywords of LIBOR flagged just for me. Okay. For the three witnesses who are my three immediate bosses, there were no phone calls and less than a dozen such emails over a six year period. That's like trying to say three big law lawyers at a law firm would not have the word court over a six year period in any of their emails, any of their documents and any of their phone calls. Us and many other desks would regularly email these three gentlemen back and forth, expressing amongst other things, what our positions were in the book and telling them whether or not we had emailed the submitter asking for live high or low. In return, these three witnesses would also email us every day, reminding us to tell the submitter to submit high or low libel. Yet, despite what we asked the regulator, they refused to provide us with any such information, instead called us liars. Uh, it, it's, it's unreasonable that there can be so much documentation in all of us and none on any of these uh, witnesses. Uh, the last point on evidence I'll make is, uh, is the following. There are dozens of other traders and dozens of senior bankers at several other banks who did exactly the same and in many cases did a lot more or worse. How do we know this? And how do we know things about the three witnesses as well? Through certain other civil litigations and accidentally we have uncovered several emails, just a few compared to the ones that exist that show that this practice existed. Rather than provide us with any of this information, the SFO and, and the SPA created what in 2018 I predicted was a sham investigation of all the other banks and quietly closed it two to three years later to deny us any of this evidence. Now, why would they do this? Well, one theory that I believe is very strong is all these other banks were bailed out by the UK government during the financial crisis. Barclays was the only bank that wasn't bailed out by the UK government. And hence, it was a lot easier to find traders at this particular bank to go after. Wow. So, um, I mean, that's pretty much what I have to say uh, about this matter. I'm hoping some of my words will lead to action because all I've done so far has only led to an action. So uh, this is my first time actually speaking in detail about this and I hope uh, somebody would do something about it because all this information exists out there uh, to show what we've said is true and what's happened is not true. Thank you. Jay, thank you so, so much. It's, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be uh, running this forum today, giving people like Jay and, and, and Matt and, and Tom and Carlo and everybody else the chance to just speak truth to power. Uh, thank goodness you're doing it. Um, but we're talking here about what, what must really be uh, something that is, is corruption. The, the system seems like it's being corrupted and that just is wholly and, and totally 
unacceptable. We somehow need to fight back against this. We somehow need to drag justice to the surface. Uh, Jay, thank you so, so much. Jay, please do send me those documents. And with your permission, we'll, we'll, we'll make a good use of them. And believe you me, um, there are so many people in the Transparency Task Force so upset and angry and frustrated with the workings of the financial system. And frankly, the ongoing catastrophic regulatory failure that we're witnessing time after time after time. There's a huge amount of momentum building here that we want to really tap into and make good use of. Uh, Paul and Mark put their hands up again. Mr. Carlio, please, your point as succinctly as you can. Then we'll jump to Mark and then we'll go to, to, uh, to Carlo. Paul. Just two things on, on what Jay's just said. Um, the, he's absolutely right. It's inconceivable and actually impossible for there to be only the emails featuring him and nobody else. And the important thing here is that those emails cannot be deleted by the individual in question. So, you know, because they're all stored in the central server. So someone somewhere in a very senior position will have had to have accessed that server and either concealed them or suppressed them or, or deleted them. Secondly, the he's quite right about uh, the, the, the government owned banks. Uh, Jay will probably know that in September 14, Lloyd, who, where I was working at the time, sacked eight traders over LIBOR. Um, I've had the opportunity to see their appeals the, that they made internally, and every one of them, for want of a better phrase, fingered senior management um, as to uh, involvement in a variety of uh, manipulation, concealment, and lowballing. Um, and if you look online, Google search all of these launched employment tribunal claims, and now there's no trace of them. All of them were settled, and in certainly at least one case, I know it was a fairly substantial um, settlement, and there's been a suggestion that one was even covertly reinstated, um, you know, uh, so as to, uh, you know, uh, let's say, just uh, keep the beans in or the worms in the can. So, yeah, I think Jay's absolutely spot on. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Mark Bishop. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> a thought occurred to me while I was listening to, to Jay, uh, and that was private criminal prosecution, specifically of regulators, uh, whether that's for perverting the course of justice, misconduct in public office, perjury, or any other offence. Um, uh, now, very many times there are allegations of regulatory failure uh, that stray into regulatory cover-up and dishonesty, but the victims are people who've got no money, so they have nothing much they can do about it. They are victims of financial scams or of mistreatment of SMEs that generally results in the bankruptcy of the individuals. Um, in these cases, the victims are city traders. Uh, I don't want to inquire about the financial means of any of those traders who were prosecuted, in some cases sent to jail. Um, but it may be that even after all of this, they still have a significant net worth. It may also be that they have a great many friends who have worked in the industry or are still in it, who have even greater net worth. And none of those people want to think that their liberty is on the line if a regulator decides that it needs to serve up a few small fry in order to protect itself. So there's a lot of people who have a lot of money who have an interest in bringing that regulator to heel. And I've just asked them to think about whether, you know, following this session, they should have conversations amongst themselves about who might be prosecuted and where and how, and who might fund that. Uh, because I do think that there could be a significant rebalancing of power between regulators and society brought to bear, perhaps unusually, through those who should be regulated. Mark, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Thank you. We're going to move swiftly on, but before we do that, before we move to Carlo, let's please show our, our um, um, immense appreciation to Jay. Um, it's a privilege to be hearing your testimony for the first time, Jay. It really, it really is. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know we've called this event the Lowball Snowball Project. Please understand this is not an event in isolation. It's a, an event with, with purpose. This is not going to be the only event we run about Snowball. That the lowball tapes has inspired a complete line of thought that basically says we're going to keep going until justice happens we're going to keep going until justice happens there's enough of us with enough evidence and enough motivation and frankly enough disgust to not tolerate how things are being 
I do not want my kids growing up in a country where there is not justice. It really is as simple as that. And if we don't fight the injustice now, we'll pay a massive price for it later on down the road. I promise you this. Our country cannot afford to stand by when we need to be standing up. This is a clarion call for every right-minded human being in this country to shine a big bright light on this injustice and the significance of it. That's why we're doing this. We're snowballing the lowball tapes into some real, real action. Jay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's go straight to Carlo. Carlo, please give us an introduction, some context and, and go for it. I am staggered at the amount of truth that's coming out today. I, I really, really am. Carlo, over to you, sir. Thank you. Oh, hello. So, so thanks for organizing this and, and, and caring about this. Um, I, um, I, uh, I started working at Barclays at the time, just after university. And when these things, um, in the period that we're talking about, 2006, 2007, 2008, I was uh, the junior on the team that was trading uh, Euro interest rates. Uh, so that's how I, you know, I got involved in this. Um, and in a sense, it, it, the, because I was on the Euro side, things for me is like different from the other guys, but they're the same in a sense. So all the things that, for example, all the great point that Jay made, they applied identical to, to my case. And in fact, I have plenty more examples from the Euro side of the business, which fully support what Jay said. I mean, just for an example, about the emails of management that were not disclosed. When this started, I was still working for Barclays. So I actually found some of the emails involving my management that I still had them in my mailbox, which Barclays somehow had not found in their own searches. Now, those six emails that I printed out and provided were are to date the only emails involving my management. Uh, but anyway, there's just plenty more examples supporting exactly the same thing. Um, I want to talk about some uh, slightly different things. The first one is, um, you were asking, how can we get justice? I think what I want to say is like the very first thing is we want our convictions overturned. Yeah. Because... And we've been sent to prison for something that we haven't done, for a crime that even even existed. We got our life were destroyed. I mean, I didn't see the birth of my daughter because I was in prison. My, I, I missed the first two years of life of my daughter because I was in prison. My wife did all of this on her own in the middle of a pandemic. And even now that I'm out of prison, I still have huge limitations on my freedom. I mean, I can't travel because of security risk, apparently which means that, you know, I'm Italian. My daughter hasn't been able to meet her Italian family yet because we can't travel. Um, I mean, even traveling within England, we have to ask permission to go anywhere to probation because apparently there's security risk of some sort. Um, I mean, I can't drive the car because the insurance would insure me because I'm a convicted fraudster. Um, I mean, financial security is a problem because I mean, the SFO is still coming after me because I'm supposed to pay for their legal cost. Like their legal cost in building a non case against me. <laughs> the, the judge ordered me to pay 725,000 pounds of legal cost to this serious fraud office. Um, I can't get a mortgage because I'm a fraudster and therefore I cannot even get a mortgage to pay the SFO. Um, so, I mean, our life has been completely turned upside down. I, I mean, also, you know, my work as a trader, um, in 2011, I went back to academia, I did my master, and then I won a scholarship for a PhD at the University of California. So I had been, um, when all of this happened, I mean, I got charged in 2017. I was teaching philosophy at the University of California and doing my PhD. We had a life there. We had a home there. I, you know, I, I came back to face trial because I thought this made no sense. And by then we had so much evidence to show our innocence that I just literally, we just came home. But you know, our home is still there. M my clothes are still there. My, my books are still there. My, everything is there because you know, we just came here for the trial. 
Um, and now it looks like I'm not even allowed to even go back home any, to the US ever again because of my immorality. Um, so, I mean, I, I think there's, 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 there's the general issue of, of what happened to the, in the system, but there's also the very real problem of our convictions because so far the British system has still, still been stopping us from actually getting our convictions overturned. Um, and this takes me to the second point that I want to um, talk about. Um, I mean, once our convictions are overturned, which I think is the first thing, then the question is, I mean, who did this? And, and how is it possible that people were actually able to do this? Um, like it shows that there's a lot of wrong with, with the way the whole system is, is someone can actually do this and get away with it. Yes, yes. Um, and I mean, we've been talking about, you know, the SFO and the banks, but I think we're missing one fundamental problem here, which is the involvement of the judiciary. And I think, you know, you're talking about, we want to have a judge-led inquiry. Well, who is going to be this judge? None of this could have happened without very, very significant involvement of at least elements of the judiciary. Jesus. I mean, the SFO could have charged us. The bank could have provided the, some emails and bank's lawyer could have, could have helped the SFO in coming up with some legal concoction or whatever. But really, the law under which we were tried and convicted, that law was invented by the trial judge just before the beginning of our trial. Um, and then that was confirmed by the Court of Appeal. All the attempts to go to the Supreme Court were systematically blocked over the years with the most incredible reasonings. Um, I just wanna, just to, to, just to drive this point home, I just wanna talk a little bit about the specific, specificity of the, of the Uribor case. Oh from the point of view of the law, right? Because, you know, the, the whole, the, the legal basis for all these trials have been that any considerations of commercial interest in submitting LIBOR rates are unlawful and have always been unlawful, regardless of whether the rates are actually factually correct, right? This is how all these cases have been built. And on the LIBOR case, I mean, the judge ruling that said that any consideration of commercial interest turns the whole thing into a fraud. That ruling was made in absence of absolutely any evidence, but with some ambiguous statements by the BBA that, you know, more or less tried to help the SFO or something like this. Now, um, when after convicting the LIBOR traders, the SFO came after the Euro traders, the situation was completely different because first of all, the Euro market is regulated by you know, it's the Euribor, it's the Euro, Euribor Banking Federation. It's based in, the, in, in Europe. It's Brussels, it's got nothing to do with England, it's got nothing to do with LIBOR, it's got nothing to do with the BBA. But also what the SFO did not realize at the beginning is that Euribor has a written code of conduct, has a written document stating what the rules were. And that did not support the legal concoction that had been created to prosecute the LIBOR traders. And nowhere it says there's a prohibition of commercial interest. So at that point, the, what the judge proposed, the SFO and the judge proposed, is that the actual written documents with the Euribor rules has to be supplemented by an implicit provision that self-evidently prohibits commercial interest, regardless of where the rates are right or wrong or anything. Now, this is obviously, you know, ridiculous, but then what we did was we uh, offered as witnesses with witness statements, the entire team that wrote that code of conduct, including the lawyer who in 1999 drafted the actual Euribor rules. So now we have the entire team who devised the Euribor rules, who wrote the Euribor rules, who oversaw the Euribor rules, like all the people in charge who wrote witness statements where they very clearly said, said we wrote these rules, we devised these rules, 
there is absolutely no prohibition of commercial interest. The idea that commercial interest could be prohibited from commercial markets is absurd. This could not have worked. We discussed this. It could not have worked. The whole idea of a system where you have, you know, you take out the top higher rates, lower rates, average, the whole technique is devised precisely because we're fully aware that you cannot take commercial interest out of commercial rates. Um, so we had all these witness statements of the people who wrote the Uribe rules to say, you judge and say, for you are wrong. What these guys did was perfectly as the system was supposed to work. Now, what did the judge do? He disallowed all the evidence. And he said, no, I'm not interested in what the people who wrote this rule thought. I'm not interested in what people who used those rules thought. I'm not interested in what lawyers who wrote this code of conduct thinks that the meaning of this code of conduct is. I'm just not interested in any of this. Because apparently, um, there's a rule in the English system where if a judge is absolutely sure about the interpretation of a, a contract, because this is a Belgian civil contract, technically, he doesn't have to listen to any evidence. He can just go with his own personal opinion. So we have the situation where there is a judge with you know, no expertise whatsoever in finance, commercial markets or anything, you know, someone whose expertise is in drunk driving and burglaries, who gets called in to run this trial. And the first thing it, it does, it says, I am so absolutely sure about the interpretation of this very specific piece of financial market regulation the, based in Belgium from 20 years ago, I am so sure of this that I don't need to listen to the opinion of any expert at all, of the people who wrote this rule. No, no, no I'm not interested in that. And I decide that there is self-evident implicit prohibition of commercial interest and that to breach this self-evident implicit prohibition of commercial interest in a Belgian civil contract is unlawful in English law. So this is the basis of our trial and of our conviction. Um, I mean, obviously it doesn't make any sense, but you know, you might make come up your own ideas about why this has happened, but, but then we thought, okay, we'll take this to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal will have some common sense and we'll realize that, you know, I mean, how can this judge be so completely sure about this thing to even rule out all the evidence? Well, the Court of Appeal said, um, well, we agree with the judge. The judge is perfectly entitled if he's absolutely sure about the interpretation of something to dismiss all the evidence. Um, now, I mean, what do you think of this? Um, it's absurd. Well, it's absurd. And then of course the court of appeal, I mean, we tried to go to the Supreme Court hoping that there is someone who has some something. Um, and, but you know, to go to a court, Supreme Court, you need to have permission from the Court of Appeal. And of course the Court of Appeal said, no, you can't go to the Supreme Court. Um, so I'm just saying, you know, it's just, I mean, you try to, you try to make sense of this and you can't. And, and, and this is not about the SFO trying to save the jobs or whatever, this is about something a lot deeper, which ramifications that I can't think of, yeah. but that makes me a bit sick, to be honest, yeah. and, 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 and not particularly optimistic about the outcome either. Uh, now, I don't think it's everyone in the judiciary because had it been everyone, then you know they would have let us go to the Supreme Court. If they kept stopping us any attempt to go to the Supreme Court, and I think there's been four so far, it's because possibly they were not fully confident that the Supreme Court would have agreed with them. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, you, you, see, you see my concern here, there's something. And, yeah. um, and also, I mean, one very final thing, just going back to what I was saying before. Um, I mean, I just don't understand how it's possible for a judge in good faith to come up with all of this, to retroactively invent a non-existing law, yeah. which doesn't make any sense against all the evidence. 
and then to you know look at the accused in their face i mean we were on trial we were we had the first trial that lasted four months they couldn't convict us so they retried us for another three months so that judge was looking at us and our families in the face for seven months in full knowledge that he had invented the non-existing financial market regulation that he knew nothing about in order to carry out that trial and to obtain the convictions. And then he's handing out these nonsensical judgments and sentences to you and destroying your family, destroying your life, destroying everything. Now, I mean, what sort of person do you have to be to do yeah. something like that? <laughs> and what sort of motivations and interest like we don't, that I cannot even think of. Yeah might you have that if you're capable of carrying out such a thing? Carlo, 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 uh, it, it's, it's, it's shocking. After years and years and years and years of doing what we're doing, this is, this is shocking beyond, beyond compare, Carlo. How the hell you've managed to keep yourself sane I, in, in the meantime, I, I don't know, I, all of you. I just don't know. You must, you must just be wired up in a particular way to be able to cope with it because it is just, I'm, 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 I'm disgusted at what I'm hearing today. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm truly, truly disgusted at what I'm hearing today. Things, things have to change. Carlo, thank you for, thank you for coming forward. I, I promise you, man to man, person to person, I personally will do everything I can to try to help expose what this is, to, what is going on. That there's no point us trying to fix the financial system if we haven't got the basics of law and integrity. If we haven't got the basics, right, then nothing else is worth trying to fix, you know? Um, nothing else is worth trying to fix. And you've raised a very, very valid question mark over the, over the, uh, the, the, the efficacy of the judiciary. Um, I, I think, I think it's a, it's a case of the truth will eventually come out and let's let's try to make that happen. Can we please all show our appreciation to Carlo? Thank you, Carlo, very, very, very much for sharing your thoughts today, Carlo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we're going to go to uh, Lord Mackay. Uh, Lord Mackay is here today because he has an interest in the workings of the judiciary. So the, the, the timing of your comments, uh, Lord Mackay, is, is going to be very interesting. Lord Mackay, please do share with us your thoughts. Of course, take yourself off mute if you haven't already done so. Thank you. Well, first of all, I should say that uh, I was the Lord Chancellor uh, for some almost 10 years as the head of the judiciary. And I also had the responsibility of appointing judges. Uh, and that was a solemn and uh, very demanding uh, responsibility. But I have listened to what's been said here, and I think that the fundamental point, as I understood it, before the question of law arises, is the fairness of the trial. Uh, and one of the facts that I think is indisputable is that there is very strong law for disclosure to the, of the uh, matters that are against or de undermining the case for the prosecution have to be shown to the defense. That's part of the basic law of fairness in criminal trials. I had some part in formulating that when I was Lord Chancellor, but it is, doesn't matter about that. What matters is that it's part of the law and therefore as part of what should go on. Now, we've heard a bit about the formulation of the law and I think that that's quite a difficult matter for me to get involved in, except to say that as I understand it, as I understand it, you can uh, ask the Supreme Court to grant permission to come there, even if the Court of Appeal don't want it. Uh, and the Court of Appeal are supposed to decide whether or not there is a real substantial question if they are asking or being asked to refer the matter to the Supreme Court. It's not 
proper for them to do it on the basis that they think they may be overturned. They are to say whether or not there is a fair point to be considered. Anyway, they, as I understand the present law, it is possible to apply to the Supreme Court, uh, although the Court of Appeal declined to do so. Uh, and uh, as I say, it's a long time since I retired now, and therefore you have to take it that what I'm saying is subject to checking. But I believe it to be the fact. And so far as I'm concerned, the fairness of the judiciary is absolutely vital to the fairness of law and justice in this country. And that was my main concern in appointing judges. And so far as I know, those judges that I appointed were absolutely uh, fair and uh, honorable in all their work. So I really think that it's a question of showing that there was in the trial a failure to disclose matters which were contrary or undermining the prosecution case. And of course, there is also the question of law about whether the whole thing is an offense. Uh, that there's a, a, a point of view about that which is quite serious. And so far as I'm concerned, I think there's a substantial question there. I don't think it would be right for me to try to say what I think about it, except that I think there's a substantial question that would be worthy uh, of the Supreme Court. But the thing that's worrying me is the fairness of the system, because yes. in my view, it is absolutely essential that our judicial system is fair in the way it works. And I think that it's important to realize the level at which this sort of thing happened and whether the people at the top were uh, involved in a way that uh, should have been taken into account when people lower down in the scale were being prosecuted. These are my thoughts. And uh, as I say, it's a long time now since I retired. And it's probably time I retired altogether, but I haven't done that quite yet, although the time may be getting near. Uh, but I do feel very strongly for the fairness of our system. And what we've heard today is a serious challenge to that. Yes. And I would like people who are concerned to examine the matter uh, and see what should be done. Thank you very much. Lord Mackay, well said, sir. Can we show our appreciation to Lord Mackay for his thoughts today? You've given us a wonderful steer on the way in which we might be able to snowball this forward, Lord Mackay. Thank you very, very, very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Lord Mackay, if you don't mind, sir, we'll, we'll pick your brains once or twice to get your thoughts on one or two other matters relating to all this. But thank you very, very much indeed from the bottom of my heart to coming out today and sharing those thoughts so so openly and so strongly today. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll leave you now. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Mackay. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. I, I'm, I'm blown away by that. I really am blown away by that. That's fantastic input. That really is fantastic input. Mr Verity, are you able to, um, to join us and take us off off mute, please, if you can? Hi, Andy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Over to you. Over to you. <laughs> Um, I didn't even hear your intro, I'm afraid. I've had these nightmare connection issues, but um, well done on hosting this event. I, I, as such, for me, it's, I hardly feel like talking because you've got all the, all the interesting people other than me that you need to talk to. Um, I'd be interested to hear, it, maybe I missed it from Lord Mackay, whether he thinks this should go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, um, just, to interrupt, just to interrupt you, it's a pity you missed that bit. Uh, as I understood it, and I'm no lawyer, but as I understood it, he, he said things that made me believe there is a basis whereby this could go to the Supreme Court, even if the Court of Appeal doesn't want it to happen. So we'll, we'll have further dialogue with him, because that seems to be the way forward here. Uh, sorry to yeah. interrupt you, I just wanted you to make you aware of it. He was very clear in his opinion. He was also saying, of course, his thinking may be a bit out of date, he's been retired for a while, etc. But it seems to us he's given us a really clear steer, Andy. Back to you. Yeah. OK, thank you. That's good to have that update. And that's encouraging. Um, I had an exchange with him where I was asking him if uh, he wanted to come onto the news. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, there's certainly a case wow. if 
if the traders get if the traders get um, some sort of legal action going, some attempt to leapfrog the appeal court because the appeal court. Well, we're in public, so I have to be a little bit careful the words I use. I don't think it has been wholly honest itself. This whole scandal, still after getting to know it for six years, leaves my jaw on the floor with incredulity. People can't believe it's happened. I've struggled for years to get the BBC to do something about it because people have to climb what I call the hill of incredulity. You, you, you just can't believe it could happen like this. And unfortunately, it does. And I think of it a little bit like um, medical science got to know the human body via what went wrong with it. We learn the way our country really is, the way our justice system really is, and how things really work via what goes wrong, via this particular ghastly illustration of what can go wrong, where, you know, it, it's sort of stepping right back from it. Sometimes I step right back and scope right out. One is, one is that it it's, um, illustrates horribly a double standard and hypocrisy that goes on. Um, it illustrates horribly how the fundamental democratic principle of equality before the law has been repeatedly violated, in fact, in fact, neglected to the point where it looks like a lonely little principle that no one pays any attention to. Um, there's that, there's the, there's, there's the dysfunction of the justice system, the failure to prosecute fraud, um, and all of these things, but it, just focusing in a very focused way on what needs to happen. One is it needs to go to the Supreme Court, Two, there needs to be a parliamentary inquiry. And I, I think Kevin probably had to go, but I don't, I know I'm preaching to the choir with him, but um, it's intolerable in our democracy that a committee of MPs can be so sorely misled yeah. about a really important public policy matter by people in power, by people, I mean, for example, just one example, Dear Love's tape to PJ, where it shows that, you know, where it suggests that the Bank of England has been involved, it implicates the Bank of England and the UK government, Downing Street, in what's now regarded as criminal activity. That tape was known about by the regulators in 2010. So when they put out their regulatory notices about Barclays, and when they held the hearings in 2012 about it, they knew all about it. The regulator knew about it. Margaret Cole, the head of enforcement, was played it and chose not to do anything about it. Um, the, the, the same applies in the United States. That was the prompt I've heard from Robertson Park, who led their LIBOR investigation, for them actually launching the LIBOR investigation was that tape. But no one mentioned that tape or that conversation in the regulatory notices. What happened? What's the nature of the cover up here? It goes on in the negotiation between the DOJ, US Department of justice if you can call it that and the serious fraud office um and well actually not the sfo I beg your pardon but and the fsa as was became the fca that negotiation with barclays legal and in each case it's the bank's lawyers who are in a position to manipulate it because essentially the sfo or the doj outsources its investigation to them they don't do any of their own investigation they hardly even make any disclosure requests it's just handed over. And this bundle of evidence was compiled for a completely different purpose. It wasn't, ha it wasn't compiled in order to pursue a criminal prosecution. It was compiled under very restricted terms, terms that could be confined by Barclays Legal. So for example, no one looked at Bob Diamond's line. No one, no one looked at his email chains because he was in Barclays Group. It was only focusing on Barclays Capital. So you don't hear about Bob Diamond, didn't hear much about Chris Lucas, even though other people, so, so you know, but nevertheless, David Green had that tape and access to that tape in 2012. He didn't even choose to interview Dear Love until 2016. So what's going on there? This guy is the director of the Serious Fraud Office and he's not even choosing to inquire into lowballing. It's sort of all understood. Oh, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. That goes up to Whitehall. And, and the DOJ too, I said, well, why didn't you pursue lowballing? Oh, well, you know, there's difficulties with um, Foreign Corrupt Practices and Bribery Acts. Um, you know, and, and it, Lanny Breuer, who also wouldn't prosecute Wall Street over the financial crash, the real thing that caused it, you know, CDOs, um, he was under fire for that. And here's the politics of it. It's a witch hunt that started in America. I went over to America to see Alex Paybon after he came out of jail to get an interview with him for our 2017 film. And I remember talking to the Americans there and they were saying, ah, British witch hunt. I said, no, it started in America. 
It started with the CFTC and Gary Gensler and people back in 2008. But look, I don't want to give you too much information. It's all ghastly and fascinating. You've heard it from the traders themselves. They're the people who really count. They've had a hellish experience, as have their families, yeah. bewildered in this kind of Kafka-like world where people want to condemn before they understand. And, and the unfortunate thing is that it hasn't got up to the Supreme Court. There are two judges, Davis, who, who first, William Davis, who first gave the ruling that said no commercial influence on LIBOR, and the Lord Chief Justice, who can somehow call himself that, John Thomas. They sat on four appeals, including Carlos that he just mentioned, and two with Tom Hayes, and also I think they sat on the appeal with Jay Merchant, where it wasn't allowed up to the Supreme Court. Can it be a coincidence that the guy, William Davis, who came out with the ruling saying any commercial influence is unlawful, which coincidentally retrospectively criminalized every attempt to influence LIBOR, including by the government, the Treasury and the Bank of England. Um, can it be a coincidence that he and John Thomas sit on the same, uh, are on all four LIBOR appeals where they refuse permission to go up to the Supreme Court? Um, and I'll tell you, but I can't name names, but I have spoken to a former Supreme Court justice who says that it's their view that, that it's not criminal, that these acts weren't criminal, but they can't speak up because the convention of speaking out in public against absurd decisions by your peers is so rigid in our bar, in our bar where they don't have to look people in the eye who've gone to jail or their families or the, or the children who haven't had their fathers around. They don't have to do that because they're just in their little chambers making their rulings. They're not facing the human consequences of what they're doing. Davis and Thomas, I wanted to name in our series, but I was told we had too many names already. We couldn't hold everyone to account. But there's such a sprawling epic scandal as you've, as you've seen. What needs to happen, Supreme Court, parliamentary inquiry, those two things. And I think what, what members of the Transparency Task Force can do is write to the Treasury Committee, write to those MPs, yeah. all of them, put pressure on them, whether or not they're your constituent, put pressure on them to do something. They have been lied to. They have been lied to and evidence withheld, which was highly material. Andrew Tyree said it to me, he thought it should be reinvestigated. So, so did Theresa Pierce, so did Mark Garnier. Now what we need to do is put pressure on Mel Stride to, to, to have a similar sort of investigation. Um, and they should listen to the traders. They should listen to, um, well, they should listen to the tapes yeah. and the evidence that were withheld from parliament. And they should start thinking about democracy and what their role is. And if they really care about their democratic role, as in my experience, most MPs actually do, then they will do something about it. That's enough for me to talk to more interesting people. <laughs> Mr. Andy Verity, thank you so much, not just for that, Andy, but for your programme. It has inspired today's event and everything that's going to follow off the back of it. Andy Verity, we salute the work that you do, not just the global takes, but everything else you've done over the years. You really have been a complete ambassador for righteous investigative journalism over a long, long time. Thank God you are here, Andy. Thank God you're here. If you weren't around, Andy, we wouldn't be running this event. This stuff that's going to happen may not happen at all. Thank you so, so much. Okay. I am, I, I am, I am, I'm blown away by what we're hearing today, folks. I'm just blown away by it. I'm not even going to try to cover that up. I'm just blown away by what we're hearing. We're going to go to Paul Carlier. Then I'm going to play you a video interview that uh, myself and Tom Hayes did on, I think it was Thursday last week. Um, you really need to understand uh, Tom Hayes's perspective on what's been going on. It's, it's remarkable testimony. It really is. But just before we get to that, we're going to hear from Paul Carlier, who kindly agreed to kind of do a little bit of a, a wash up session, trying to bring together some of the threads about what we are talking about today. And I promise you, promise you this. The Lowball Snowball project is an ongoing project. Today is just the beginning of this stage. We'll do exactly what Andy Verity has just said. We'll campaign for parliamentary inquiry. We'll campaign for uh, Supreme Court. And we'll just, we'll just keep going. We will just keep going. There's no point living your life if you're going to live your life in a, in a toxic sewer of unprofessionalism and illegality. There's no point. We may as well just fix this. Uh, Paul Cardia, over to you. Thanks, Andy. I, I mean, there's very little to say that hasn't already been said by the testimony of the guys here. And, you know, I can't even begin to imagine what they've been through. You know, it makes my own issues with the FCA <laughs> pad into insignificance. But I do want to mention, and I do want to thank Andy Verity on this, because 
sadly, when the judiciary breaks down or when the whole structure breaks down, it requires people with integrity in the media that are capable of shining a spotlight to do it. And Andy's done nothing but step up to the plate in that respect um, throughout. Um, as mentioned, I, I, I want to just expand on the issues here and explain the much wider and ongoing significance. I've been saying for many years that libel or lowballing was ground zero for far more than just libel, and that those being prosecuted were a little more than scapegoats. It's understood the world over the importance of significant persons or parties not being in a position where they can be compromised. And there's a reason for that, because being compromised creates conflicts of interests, increases the risk of prejudice, risk of dishonesty and corruption. And in the case of regulation or oversight, the risk of the oversight function and obligations become entirely corrupted and corrupts the entire system. In the case of LIBOR, the FCA, the Bank of England and the government allowed themselves to be compromised by way of their involvement in the lowballing and the subsequent concealment of it. By doing so, these bodies gave the banks leverage. They gave them the equivalent of a mafia having sexually compromising photos of a politician. And over the last decade, that leverage appears to have been applied time and time again by the banks across the spectrum of financial issues from HBOS Reading, RBS GRG, IRHP, I call it fraud, they, the FCA still insists on calling it mis-selling, and the 2013-14 FX investigation, which was similarly a, an absolute stitch up and sought to just single out a few banks, create the impression of loan rogues and individuals, when in fact it was industry-wide and had been accepted practices for years that the Bank of England had known about since 2008. So the result has been industrial scale wrongdoing by banks since then that has gone largely unpunished or punished to the minimum extent possible, yeah. even unlawfully engineering redress schemes that sought to conceal the extent of wrongdoing and limit the liabilities of the banks, leaving hundreds of thousands, if not millions of victims without justice and appropriate remedy. In turn, with, low, with, with the libel, libel tapes, you, you have the SFO and potentially the CPS also allowing themselves to be compromised in the libel perversion of justice. And since then, the SFO and similarly City of London Police have gone to extraordinary lengths not to investigate and prosecute the likes of Lloyds, RBS, etc., for the frauds committed by their BSU and GRG units, respectively. And that's against thousands of UK business customers. And once each of these bodies has dishonestly suppressed or concealed wrongdoing once, they create a dishonest precedent that they are then forced to continue on subsequent cases. So it often means that if you come forward as a fresh victim, you're, the outcome has already been determined by the dishonesty that's gone before. They can't afford to investigate yours because it could, could reveal the fact that they concealed and suppressed something previously. So the lowball tapes and what they expose has led to a decade in which the entire hierarchy of, of financial oversight was compromised and the results are clear for all to see. And that's essentially part of the lowball snowball. Um, before Tom speaks, and I, I want to sign off just on this, this example of scapegoating in both LIBOR and FX. I worked at UBS on the Zurich trading floor when the LIBOR investigation erupted in 2011. Whole desks of traders and senior managers literally disappeared overnight and LIBOR was a taboo subject pending the investigation outcome. And I use the term investigation in the loosest possible sense because this is how it played out. UBS and their lawyers interviewed everyone involved in LIBOR and in 2014, the same in FX, in Zurich, where all of the interviews could be concealed under Swiss banking law. Having done that, they selected relatively junior traders and hauled them over the border into Germany and interviewed them again. They then used these interviews to sack those junior traders whilst allowing all the senior individuals to escape sanction. So, and incidentally, you know, in both cases, LIBOR and FX, the junior traders scapegoated were non-Swiss. In FX, it was a young British kid and a young German guy and I think it was a Belgian and uh, British guy in, in the case of libel. And in Tom's case, okay, he was the ideal patsy for UBS because he was A, non-Swiss, B, he worked as far away from Zurich head office as was possible, and C, he was no longer employed by them. So, you know, it's a, you know, th that's just you know, the, the scale of the scapegoating that's gone on here. Well, thank you very much indeed. I, I, Paul, I put a note in the chat. Uh, what you have just explained, this idea that um, the, the, the effectively is exactly as you put it, it's the equivalent of the mafia having compromising photos or something and having a hold over them. And as a consequence, 
corrupting or skewing that person's conduct. It, it, it explains so much, Paul, about what we've been seeing time after time after time in terms of ongoing catastrophic regulatory fra uh, failure. The phrase you used earlier really resonated, resonated with me, Paul, when you said that, that they will kind of prosecute the minimum they can just about get away with. That really does ring true. So many, so many things are falling into place today as a consequence of what we're learning. Um, I, I am absolutely blown away by it. I really am. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I've completely rearranged my life today in terms of the next hour or so. We're going to, and if you want to do the same, please do. Of course, if you need to jump off the session, do so. You know, uh, it is recorded. You will be able to catch up later. But I urge you to try to stay around for what I'm about to play, which is the uh, video of um, of Tom Hayes talking to me last week. Um, I'm going to try and play it now. This should work. It may take a few moments. Um, but it should work and please be patient and um, I, I hope you find it I hope you find it very very interesting indeed um, I don't think you should miss it but if you need to miss it if you need to disappear do but if you can stick around for the full session then then please do so hello I'm Andy Agathangelo the founder of the Transparency Task Force we're a certified social enterprise that is dedicated to trying to fix the financial services industry it's a sector that we believe to be profoundly important to the well-being of society, to economic stability, to political stability, uh, but it only functions properly when it's behaving in an honest and credible way. We're particularly focused on areas that relate to corruption and miscarriage of, uh, miscarriages of justice, and that's why I'm especially pleased to have a chance today to speak with Tom Hayes. Uh, who has been involved with the Lobel tapes, the recent BBC Radio 4 production uh, led by the journalist Andy Verity. And uh, Tom has very kindly given me a chance to talk to him and to play this video recording in the event we have about, uh, about the Lobel tapes uh, coming up shortly. So Tom, thank you again for agreeing to set aside some time with me today. Um, please do take an opportunity, first of all, Tom, to simply introduce yourself and explain as succinctly as you can uh, what happened to you. Um, well, obviously, I'm Tom Hayes. Um, I worked in the financial markets, trading interest rate derivatives in Japanese yen, um, some of which referenced the benchmark, which was LIBOR, yen LIBOR. I mostly worked in Tokyo. I worked in Tokyo throughout the indictment period that I was charged with. Um, I did. I had that job for over 10 years. Um, I then lost that job. Um, and then out of the blue, two years later, I was arrested. Um, and then eight days later, I was simultaneously charged in the United States for the same offence that I was arrested for in the United Kingdom. So um, I was effectively charged by two jurisdictions simultaneously. Meanwhile, the jurisdiction in which I worked didn't even sanction me on a regulatory basis. Um, and um, I've been offered up as a sacrificial lamb by my employer bank, UBS, to ameliorate their fines and have them reduced by somewhere in the region of two and a half billion dollars. And um, then I was uh, prosecuted um, in the UK thankfully, because I didn't want to go to the Americans. Um, I was told I was going to get a 30-year prison sentence. And uh, although that didn't, wasn't ever, didn't ever transpire to be the case, I faced trial in the United Kingdom. Um, I faced an expert who wasn't. I faced uh, members from the British Bankers Association who perjured themselves. And I faced an employer who withheld evidence from the prosecutor and the court. And, and the regulator, and I got a 14 year prison sentence, which was reduced to uh, 11 years. So um, I served five and a half years in prison, most of which, well, three and a half years, of which was in high security prisons, uh, where I was sharing cells with people, who, you know, murderers and what, what have you. Um, and then um, I was released in January of last year. And um, I had an application to the CCRC that's been with the CCRC for over five years now. Tom, thank you very much indeed for giving such a clear and uh, succinct uh, summary of what happened to you. So I, I listened to the Lobel uh, tapes, the, the podcast on BBC Radio 4, and it, I think it's impossible for anybody 
to uh, take on board the information within that series of podcasts and not come to the conclusion that there really were um, uh, terrible, terrible uh, miscarriages of justice. I mean, uh, was it as bad and as straightforward as it came across on the on the podcast series? Well, yes, and the irony is, is that uh, the actual what actually happened and how libel works and who told what lies is actually remarkably simple. But it was very adroitly handled by very powerful people to make sure that the you know blind eye was put to the telescope and that the people who should have been looked at, weren't looked at. The communications director at the Bank of England was instructed to spin the story away from the bank and towards the traders. And of course, at that time, you know, the zeitgeist was to lock up bankers and bankers were extremely unpopular. And, um, you know, the ability of the prosecution to misrepresent what actually happened and the way the system worked um, was, you know, led ultimately to... Um, you know, to a court case that was really very emotive and very inaccurate and featured a lot of people who were prepared to lie. Um, and it, it, it really is quite simple that basically the system functioned for 20 years without issues. Um, and was it riddled with conflicts of interest? Yes. Was it a perfect system? No. Um, I think the Second Circuit in their appeal decision recently when they said it wasn't a criminal offence, noted that it goes against every notion of fairness that the bank would set the rate it traded its products against. But that's the way the rate was set up. And that's the system we operated in. Then when people started lying about the rates, that's when people started looking at the rates. And that's when people decided that they needed to shut down any sort of investigation that was going to lead up and including into the Treasury and to the Bank of England. It, it does seem like it's been a cover up, a big cover up going all the way to the top of the system. Have I have I got that right? Is that the gist of it? I mean, I don't have first hand knowledge except for the evidence I've seen during, you know, that the BBC have discovered, that others have discovered. Um, all of that evidence was seen, you know, post my conviction. None of it was in front of the jury. Um, I was aware at the time when I was working that low balling was happening because the, the rates that were getting submitted at that time were just nonsensical. They were rates of which we couldn't borrow. And I remember I had an email at one point from somebody saying, you know, have you got some positions or something? Because your rate's so low, that just looks ridiculous. And I wrote back, I said, it's all senior management. They want to show the world we're the world's strongest bank. You know, it was all done to hide liquidity and solvency issues. I mean, same time that everyone's knocking on everyone's door, be it in the Middle East, be it, um, you know, shareholders, existing shareholders for rights issues. You know, they're all trying to raise capital, you know, um, in whichever way that they can to bolster their balance sheet. And so the, the question of their solvency was, was really important to them. And I think my judge in his sentencing remarks described lowballing of a far greater magnitude and also against the rules, but justified it on some sort of noble cause basis. Um, of course, he was right. It was of far greater magnitude because they were actually lies. Um, and it was against the rules because you're not meant to lie about the rate. Um, that is a misrepresentation. Um, but, you know, a message had to be sent to the city. Um, and, um, you know, I was told afterwards the reason my sentence had only been reduced by such a small amount from its very egregious starting point was because a message needed to be sent to the city. So by locking up a few like junior traders, effectively, I know we were well paid, but you know we weren't senior in management sense. Yeah. And protecting those above us, you know, it it was it was a it was a very hand in glove moment for prosecutor, regulator, bank, um, you know, uh, politicians. I mean, and the lowball tapes did really well to actually show some of the opprobrium that we were facing in the House of Commons and the select committee hearings. And the, they weren't told the truth. They didn't hear all the evidence. They weren't, they, they weren't actually presented with an actual trader to say, well, hang on guys, that's not how the system works. You know, we weren't ever submitting false rates. Yeah, we wanted the best rate. And I was, you know, I used to, I sent the most emails because I just did it every day. I didn't cover anything up. Um, so I was a particularly easy target for UBS to select as this person that could be offered 
I think, you know, the assumption was that I would roll over and I'd plead guilty and it was a shock and awe tactic, charged in two jurisdictions, told I was facing a 30-year prison sentence in the States, lose my mind, just think I can't cope. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm still fighting 10 years on. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very, very much. There was one particular part in one of the Global Tapes episodes where you articulate the fact that you were uh, tempted to kind of basically plead guilty, turn witness on other people with a view to negotiating a lighter sentence. Um, um, you decided not to do that, which is a remarkably courageous thing to do, a remarkably courageous thing to do. You wanted to stand your ground and fight your court and basically just speak the truth and not to not to you know lie about the situation i appreciate it's a, it's a long time since then tom but can you remember uh, what sort of thoughts are going through your mind about what must have been an incredibly tough decision because you you would have known that that decision was going to have significance one way or another in your life yeah i mean i think when I was charged by America, my life felt very out of control. I didn't feel like I had any agency to make any decisions about what my situation was going to be. I felt like I, I was going to have to go in and plead guilty to something I wasn't guilty of. I've been put on this cooperation program on the advice of my lawyers. I hadn't really been offered any other choices as to what I should do. Um, you know, but my main goal was to get charged. And at the time I was having a nervous breakdown and slowly as time went by my mental health improved somewhat and then I was meant to be charged in the autumn but they moved my charging date to the same day that the parliamentary report on banking standards was published so magically they could publish that report and charge me on the same day right. and um at that point you know I felt like I'd been told I was all clear of cancer because I knew I couldn't be extradited but it was also the first point where I could actually take back some control and decide what I wanted to do and was I prepared to take the witness stand and lie about my co-defendants and lie about their conduct and potentially send six innocent, maybe more. I mean, they had 20 people on my indictment, more, in, more innocent people to prison. Um, no, I wasn't prepared to do that. And also I wasn't prepared to plead guilty for something I didn't think was even a crime. Mm. Um, so I was so angry. I was very full of rage. And um, I remember my now ex-wife, unfortunately, saying to me at the time, um, Tom, you've got to do something. You're so angry. You've got to either accept this situation that you're in or you've got to fight it. But she said, I can't live with you the rest of your life being this angry. She said, you know, and if you're going to fight, go and get a different legal opinion. So I went and saw a QC called Charles Sherrard and he was doing a murder trial at the Old Bailey. And I went and saw him at the Old Bailey and we sat outside a bar in the, in the sunshine and I brought some documents with me and I showed him some of the documents, like emails from my managers and stuff. And he turned around to me and he, he looked at me and he said, Tom, you shouldn't be pleading guilty to this. You know, you've oh. got a defence. But obviously my defence was severely hamstrung by the false confessions I'd had to make during the course of my interviews, um, which, were, which was a problem for me because so many times I was asked questions and I just wanted to answer them in a different way, but I couldn't answer them honestly in the way that I wanted to ask answer them you know and so then i'm in a trial where the trial judge had boiled the single issue down to dishonesty and i was sat there saying well i'm honest and i had to lie in these interviews so by definition i was being dishonest in the interview so i was really sort of like stuck between a rock and a hard place there yeah 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 Tr truly remarkable there's one part of the global tapes tom where you say something like um you know there you were in, in, in trouble for doing something that uh, you and your colleagues probably wouldn't even thought was bad enough to get sacked over because it was basically widespread normal industry practice within your within your part of the system and now you're yeah. facing the chance of actually literally going to jail for it well uh, when i was fired no one would believe i was fired for anything to do with libel they said no one gets fired for that there was this assumption that it's because i'd lost some money i mean i literally I had to say to people, no, I'm serious. It was to do with libel. And I remember when the investigation started at City, um, I wasn't suspended. You know, I wasn't taken off the desk. There was no official inquiry. 
So this inquiry was going on with these lawyers from New York, but because I hadn't been suspended and my manager was telling me I wasn't going to lose my job and it was just a box ticking exercise and I had nothing to worry about. You know, I didn't go, my, my ex-wife was saying to me, get legal advice, get legal advice. And I said, no, 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 my bosses have told me it's fine. The CEO's told me it's fine. There's nothing for me to worry about. And then the next minute I get fired and I lose my job. And that was a shock. And then, you know, I just thought I, they paid me to leave and they gave me a standard reference. And I just thought I'd get another job. And then I couldn't get another job because the investigations were heating up. So I thought I'd just sit it out and then it would die down. Yeah. Um, and I didn't hear anything. And then two years later, I was just suddenly arrested out of the blue. And Folks, we're going to, um, we're going to interrupt the proceedings because Andy Verity would like to come in to make a point. Mr. Andy Verity, over to you, then we'll go straight back to Tom. Sorry, I didn't necessarily expect you to do that, um, Andy, but thank you. No, I just wanted to say, um, I, I don't know how long the video is. It looks quite, quite a chunky interview, but I, I just wanted to say um, that Tom made a false confession and didn't sign it because something about his Asperger's, perhaps, uh, men, men, he, he really couldn't bring himself to, to lie. And it, it, he had a sort of an intellectual indigestion with it, you know, and, and, and that was... No. And that was part of the anger, but 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 also yeah. I, I just wanted to say that the history of yes. straight rigging is littered with false confessions, um, and what happens in the states is that the, the DOJ uses such a yeah, big right. threat of a really long jail sentence and such a huge carrot, no jail at all if you cooperate and go along with their version of events. That it's kind of like torture, in the sense that when people are tortured they will just eventually say whatever their torturer wants to hear. And that's what people do with the DOJ. They just say what their torturer wants to hear because it's better for their family, for them to have a guilty plea and no prison time and keep their money, not have to spend it on loads of defence lawyers, um, than it is to fight for the truth, to actually say no and, and be honest. So the whole way the DOJ goes about things um, perpetuates a misconceived narrative and, and people don't have, the people who should have the wherewithal to oppose that narrative and say, no, DOJ, you've got it wrong, like the British regulators or the senior bank lawyers, instead of doing that, they're paying the fines and then throwing people to the walls. And that's the really contemptible behaviour. There were meetings throughout where, where, the regulate, where the prosecutors were getting together with senior bankers, in, in Tom's case, Gibson Dunn worked for UBS, and they would be back and forth with the SFO every week, handing them evidence, supplying them with whatever they needed to throw Tom under the bus. And that's what happened to all the other traders too. And I just think that the, the probably at some point needs to be some sort of legislation to prevent this happening because this, this cynical, disgusting practice of throwing individuals under the bus in order to have lower fines for the banks is morally intolerable. Andy, thank you so, so much. Thank you. We're going to go back to the session. Um, which I hope everybody's in, enjoying, if enjoying is the right word, I think you know what I'm trying to say here, it's just remarkable, it really is remarkable. Andy, that was very helpful introduction, sorry, interjection, thank you very much. 11th, 2012, that was a sort of December the 10th, 2012, was the last normal day of my life, really. Um, you know, ever since then, it's been one massive fight, and I fought and I fought and I fought, and even if I lose, I don't ever regret fighting because I'm going to die one day and I know that I tried my best, you know, and I feel very vindicated by the decision in the United States, which incidentally hasn't been challenged at the Supreme Court by the Department of Justice because they know they'd lose. And so officially now it's not a crime in the US. So that, that was something that whatever happens in the UK process, everybody knows it's only a crime here, nowhere else, not in France, not in Germany, not in Switzerland, not in Japan. The actual misrepresentation, the lowballing, could potentially, um, you know, from, in my mind, constitute a criminal offence. Um, should we prosecute a load of people for doing that? I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's wiser people than me who make that decision. But we shouldn't have been prosecuted. None of us traders should have been prosecuted. Yeah. So uh, essentially, it's it's the, the people that shouldn't have been prosecuted and jailed were. And it, it's obvious, you know, listening to the tapes, that the people who 
should have been investigated, prosecuted, jailed, weren't. We'll, we'll come back to that point. Tom, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that quite genuinely, just say skip if you don't want to answer it, but it would be, it would be helpful to understand, it would be helpful to understand uh, what this has done to you in terms of your, your, your life. You've mentioned your ex-wife a couple of times, for example. You've mentioned the breakdown. Um, would you be happy if you wish to talk about how this has impacted you and despite that list of things that it's meant to you and what it's done to you that you've somehow managed to sort of stay sane and stay upright and keep on battling away if you're happy to talk about that please do if you're not then just say skip and we'll move no on. no no i'm happy to talk about it i mean you know i'm exhausted after fighting for so long you know they wage war against you in so many ways economically um you know by putting you in prison by attacking your family. My parents' house got raided at seven in the morning. My ex-wife, you know, got accused of you having a false name and a false address and, you know, mortgage fraud, none of which was true. They materially misled the court in that respect. They reported a solicitor's regulatory authority. They turned up at her place of work to serve her with restraint papers to try and get her the sack. Um, you know, they accused my 18 month year old son of being engaged in some sort of like asset, con you know, concealing assets because he had a national savings and investment account. That was when we weren't present in the court. Um, you know, it's it's a vicious fight. And, you know, they're very they were very good at propagating the prosecution narrative in the press. And we were told not to talk to the press. So unfortunately, that was allowed to take hold. And we have all these greedy bankers and no, that's sort of like I say, the opprobrium that, you know, we were subject to was just highly prejudicial ahead of any trial. I mean, I actually had Mark Carney make a, a speech during my trial saying that sentences should be hard, um, sentences should be longer for financial misconduct and, you know, how all of this fixing was a disgrace. It was really prejudicial and it was right in the middle of my trial. He could have made the same speech a year earlier or a year later, yeah. he chose to do it in the middle of my trial. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, it was, I've had a really hard time. I'll be honest with you. I, you know, I did lose my mind in prison and, you know, I became really very needy, totally dependent on my wife and totally panicked that she would leave me. And it, that became a self-fulfilling prophecy. She stuck with me for four years of closed condition prison. And my first home leave, when I had a chance to come out from open prison on a home leave or my second home leave, rather, she said, I don't love you anymore. I want a divorce. And I can't be angry with her because all she did was fight for me. She fought so hard, so hard. But, you know, it was like getting sentenced all over again because that was my future that was getting taken away, you know, and missing Joshua growing up and watching him having to have therapy because of the anxiety. He's, he's now severely affected by anxiety. You know, I, I both, I think, both my ex wife and I, I think, have suffered a great deal from PTSD. Um, and I've had to deal with a lot of anger issues and a lot of rage issues. And I was just, it was killing me. It was just the anger I felt was so strong. I had to really try and, you know, um, deal with those things. So it didn't sort of eat me up inside. And then, I mean, and obviously then the, the, the other thing is that you lose all your assets, you lose all your money, but you know, you can't open a bank account. You can't have a credit card. You can't have a mortgage. Um, but you know what? Those are things. Those are physical things. It's just stuff, you know. But when you lose your friends and you lose your family, and particularly your wife and child, that sort of pain. When you walk into the cell on the first day, and you look around and you think, "I'm going to be here for seven years," and it just, it just, you just, you can't really comprehend it. To be honest with you, and I look back at my time in prison, I don't really know. Uh, it's a source of continual bewilderment to me that I actually made it through that time period. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I still have very bad anxiety. I wake up in the morning feeling absolutely petrified and I've got no idea why. And there's no real reason. I can't pinpoint it. And I have to start my day and get on with things to sort of clear my mind. So, I mean, these are the, the, the long term impact on so many people across my family, my parents, my siblings. Um, you know, was just monumental. Um, and I often ask myself, well, maybe I should have just done the easy thing and pled guilty, gone to prison for 14 months in an open prison and kept all my money. 
but I'd never regret that decision. No matter how bad things are, I don't regret it. Tom, in, in all honesty, I, I find your um, your openness and your honesty and your strength bloody inspiring. I'm just being frank with you. It, it really, it really, really is. So w when you went to prison, you, you must have gone to prison knowing that you shouldn't have been there, knowing that there'd been an egregious miscarriage of justice, knowing that you and others were basically being the fall guys for the, the real culprits further up the pecking order. Well, yeah, I mean, I was delighted because my, well, they held my criminal appeal after my conviction within three months, that's unprecedented. And they did that because they wanted to do it before the result of my co-defendant's trial. I was tried alone and convicted. All my co-defendants were subsequently acquitted. So I'm convicted of a conspiracy of one, which is fine in the UK law, apparently, to manipulate a rate I didn't even choose. So it's the impossible conspiracy. But when my co-defendants were acquitted, again, that gave me a lot of vindication because I knew I hadn't played a part in wrongly sending six people to prison. Right. Um, so, you know, although I was doing a long time in my head, I just said, you know, I'm doing a year for each one of these guys who's got to stay at home with their families. Um, and, um, yeah, it was, I think, you know, when you, when you make a decision to fight, you know, they never quite believed that I would follow through. They always thought I would fold, but there are a lot of brave people. Because if you look at Matt Connolly in the States, yeah. I mean, he could have done six months home detention, paid $100,000 and just moved on with his life. And instead, he spent $4 million, his life savings, fighting the case in the US, and which led to the landmark judgment in his case. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who took very brave decisions. But I would never criticise people who pled because, you know, people who were pleading, their parents were dying, you know, they were their wives and they were in like having mental breakdowns, you know, and they just, they just couldn't cope. And it became a business decision, you know, like I'm unwell, I can't cope, I'm mentally unstable, you know, my parents aren't well, you know, and they, they wanted to try and save some sort of material possessions, you know, they didn't want to be left with nothing, which is now my position. Um, so I, I wouldn't ever criticise people for making that choice because um, those guys are just as innocent as everyone else because it wasn't a crime. Your, your sense of balance around this is just, is just remarkable. It really is. Um, uh, the Lowball Tapes series itself, um, how has that felt for you? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it would have been great to get a chance to actually get out there, the truth of the matter. How, how has it felt for you being involved with that? And has, has anything happened since? Um, well, I mean, Andy Verity did a panorama very early on when the information was far less complete. And, you know, over the years, he's done brilliant investigative journalism. You know, he's really gone into the documents. He's really understood the issues. He's not taken the narrative at face value. And he made some pretty bold claims in that series that the BBC, credit to the BBC for, you know, bit, you know showing, you know, some sort of, um, you know, some sort of uh, courage to, to power, really. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, he, as, as he understood more and he spoke more to the traders and he, un and he really began to understand the issues, I think he became very passionate about sharing it with everyone else. And the lowballing tapes, I was, my application to the CCRC, despite everything, was provisionally turned down in December and I was in a very dark place. Um, but, you know, I had some very generous supporters, some of whom sit in the House of Lords, who funded my ability to contest that provisional decision. And since that decision, we've had two things. Firstly, it was Connolly and Black, which is gigantic, because it leaves the UK as an outlier now, where this is the only place which has criminalised this conduct by inventing a rule in 2015. And we had the lowballing tapes and that resulted in people like Andrew Tyree saying, well, perhaps we should reopen the Treasury Select Committee investigation into LIBOR. And they really should because Paul Tucker lied to them. I mean, I've got documents that shows he knew that we set the rates commercially, the traders. But, you know, he would and, and you know, he denied all knowledge of lowballing. He said he had no idea that we were setting the rates commercially. None of it was true. Um, and, you know, I just think that 
the, the MPs on that panel weren't presented with the right evidence. And as, as, as when Andy went to them, said, hey, listen to this. And this guy went to prison. Yeah. They were forced to confront what actually happened. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Matt Connolly earlier, and Matt's going to be uh, talking to us about his case as well in the in the event that we've got about this. Um, um, I don't know how well you know Matt or his case, but I'll ask you the question. If you can answer it, great. If you can't, then just we'll skip it. So um, what do you make of the fact that Matt Connolly was able to prove that Patrick Meany, the senior FCA investigator on LIBOR, had produced a document for the New York court that included statements that were later proven to be false. What, what, what do you make of that, if you have an opinion on it? Yeah, well, there's a very um, sinister relationship between the FCA and the SFO, or the F, the regulators and the prosecutors. So, I mean, I can give you another example. Because um, the LIBOR manager inside UBS, the guy who was in, sort of in charge of the process of LIBOR, was a, a, was a guy whose surname is Kusa Giannis. Um, he was known in the bank as Pete the Greek, and he was going through a, a, um, an enforcement process with the FCA. And his defence to the FCA was there was a range of numbers, and I chose from the range of numbers, and I chose according to our directors' books because that's what we were told by our managers to do. And he was completely exonerated by the FCA. No fine, no ban, nothing. This was the same behaviour that I was later given fourteen years for. Now that. The SFO were aware of that decision, you know, long before my trial, but only it was only disclosed to us during the trial. Um, and, you know, there are ever other instances where UBS had made representations to the FCA that I know to be false, but the FCA just accepted them without question, despite the apps. I mean, it's, some of the representations that were made to them that they couldn't, they couldn't separate my profit and loss by currency i mean that's ridiculous that they couldn't stop separate my profit and loss by product i mean that was also ridiculous and anyone who knows anything about banking would straight away say well that can't be true but not the not the fca because you know they had a deal with ubs didn't they they had a nice pot of money coming from ubs you know there were all the documents that ubs hid in in zurich and you know they were just you know nonplussed about them um so it doesn't surprise me at all that they made misrepresentations in in um uh matt connolly's case because the the problem was was had they been truthful and honest and you know worked in a in a fair way they would have given defendants a better chance of, of justice and that's the really sad thing when the focus is on an outcome and a result rather than on truth and justice and but that's the way these prosecutors who are trying to earn their stripes trying to be promoted you know and they're judged on that metric that's the, that's what happens when you know you create that metric you create this sort of like false incentive for these guys to effectively behave badly tom thank you this is remarkably interesting i think you said something just now about a pot of money going from ubs to the fca just just help me understand that a bit better well, I mean, obviously, the only um, the uh, principles for business part of BISMA 2000, which is like the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, was the thing that the banks were fined under, you know, and, and FISMA 2000 was very broad in what it covers. I mean, like, so basically, you know, it, it covered a lot of things. What the banks were doing didn't have to be criminal um, or even didn't have to be against the regulations for them to levy big fines. Um, and obviously, banks at that point were so terrified of losing their license. You know, they were terrified because, you know, the governments of, and regulators of the time were really out to get them. You know, they just wanted to settle straight away. And in, you know, the irony is, is that, but for the low balling, they probably could have fought and won, which is evidenced by the Second Circuit's um, opinion. But the scary thing was the banks themselves didn't want to actually, they didn't actually ask the traders the right questions, because if they had, they would have sat there and thought, well, actually, hang on a minute, are we fessing up to something that we shouldn't be fessing up to? But as I said, any bank that had been involved in low balling 
axiomatically was clearly in breach of the rules. And at that point, they don't have a leg to stand on. So then it becomes easier to focus on us. Um, and so UBS cooperated exceptionally, apparently, and therefore it won, you know, plaudits for being early, for exceptional cooperation, its fines were far fewer, and in, and, and in fact, fewer fines and in, in smaller magnitude, smaller quantum. Um, so, you know, the incentives for UBS to sort of effectively run the prosecution, decide what evidence is disclosed, um, you know, the prosecutors weren't going in with warrants to the banks, and neither were the FCA. You know, they were relying on third party law firms to effectively investigate the banks themselves um, and choose to decide who was going to live and who was going to die, who was going to be blamed and who was going to be, you know, um, protected. Truly remarkable, truly remarkable, Tom. My next question for you. Um, the the lowball tapes include recordings that involve the BBA. Yeah. And in particular, John uh, Ewan, um, Ewan yeah. John Ewan of the BBA. Um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but my understanding is that he was a witness at your trial and that the lowball tapes and the other ev evidence that, that's emerged since your trial might challenge the testimony he gave. Uh, what would you say to that? Well, any rational person who has read the change, the 180 degree change in his evidence since my trial, including in his 2018 deposition for the US, which was used before the Second Circuit, will see that what the evidence he gave in my trial was false. He perjured himself in my trial. Um, I, I was the first person to be tried. He said that he had never thought that we would submit the rates commercially. It was possible as a thought experiment. Had he known about it, something would have been done about it. Well, none of that was true because he did know about it and he did nothing about it. Um, and then in later trials, when that started to become apparent, he, he basically acknowledged that it wasn't against the rules and had it been against the rules, it would have been written down and published. Unbelievably, the CCRC say that we're misinterpreting his comments and that in fact, he hasn't changed his evidence at all. I don't know how they've reached that conclusion because anyone who would has read his subsequent evidence and, and depositions and seen the written evidence that he was aware of the practice going on at the time and said the rates are representative, so I'm fine with it, would, could never, in my mind, logically draw that conclusion, except the CCRC. Um, but then, moreover, it goes beyond that because John Ewan was instrumental in, you know, lowballing and what was going on and you know the idea of you know trying to effectively cover that up and you know coordinate with the banks um because the bba is a trade association you know libel wasn't regulated it was governed by the bba who who are the banks so who who in whose interest is john ewan working paymaster is the banks effectively i actually feel sorry for john ewan I don't think he was a, I don't think he was a willing witness in my trial. I think he was a reluctant witness in my trial. I think he was threatened. I think they possibly threatened him with prosecution. Um, and I just think he was a pawn in a much bigger game. And I wish he'd had the courage to say I refuse to be a witness. But, you know, once again, you don't know until you've walked a mile in another man's shoes, do you? What, you know, what he was going through at that time and the pressure he was under. I mean, I feel very differently about the fake expert in my trial because he lied. They knew he was a fake expert yeah. and he did that for 30 pieces of silver. So that was monetary. That wasn't fear. That wasn't being pressured into it. You know, so, yeah, I think, you know, for him, the motive was just avarice, and just greed. Yeah. He was paid £412,000 to lie in my trial. Jeez, 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 jeez. This, is, this, is, this is outstanding. It really is astonishing and outstanding it, it's been described to me that the the lowball tapes and evidence from that Connolly case uh, provide proof that there was a collusive breaching of the libel rules by a number of parties including the banks bank senior executives the fca the bba bank of england the government none of which was prosecuted and instead those same parties were involved in prosecutions 
against yourself and others, including Matt Connolly, who had actually acted within the accepted and understood rules at the time. Uh, but those same parties simply sought to deny that those rules existed. W would that be a fair summary, Tom? And anything else to say about that? Yeah, it is a fair summary. And I mean, you only have to look at Peter Johnson, who yeah. objected vociferously to having to being forced to lie about the rates, but yet went to prison and pled guilty because he was so afraid of the US prosecutorial system. Um, and, you know, that it was just in 2011, it was decided, the Serious Fraud Office decided it wasn't a criminal offence and they weren't going to prosecute it. When it became apparent that the Americans were looking to prosecute it and that prosecution at that time was focusing on Barclays and that chain of people it was focusing on was going from Jonathan Matthews to Peter Johnson to Mark Dearlove, whose father was head of MI6, um, all the way up to you know, Bob Diamond, Paul Tucker, Tom Scholar, in the, the principal private secretary of the treasury that's when there was a panic inside the british establishment that they had to take back control of these prosecutions so under no circumstances could they allow you know those prosecutions to take place where they had no control of where they were going to go and also it was a it was a it, it, the, the backdrop was also in a, in a long-running fight between new york and london to be, be the preem preeminent financial center so i mean there were all sorts of you know peripheral considerations too but primarily the UK couldn't lose control of an investigation that was going to go straight into the heart of the establishment. Remarkable. Um, what, what do you think of the fact that it took a journalist, albeit a very very good one, uh, Andy Verity, uh, to expose this when so many people must have known what was really going on uh, behind the scenes? Uh, what do you think about that? Well I mean I tend to think that, you know, when you, the cover up's almost worse than the actual thing itself quite a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, you have this like conspiracy of silence, but things are very cleverly handled. So, you know, Paul Tucker, given a knighthood, oh, now he lives in South Africa or somewhere way away. He was in South Africa during my trial because if, had I had some of that evidence that showed that he lied to the Treasury Select Committee, I would have summoned him as a witness and <laughs> shown that to the jury. Um, but he wasn't, he wasn't in the country. You know, my trial judge retired 10 years early. He's now a trial judge in the Middle East, um, you know, in Dubai or wherever. Um, you know, again, just quietly moved out of the way. You know, people, um, senior people in the Bank of England who, you know, employees whose fingerprints are all over this, they're quietly moved out of the Bank of England. So people get moved out of the way. They get moved, you know, to alternative employers they get given knighthoods you know and life goes on um and you know it's everyone's everyone's happy until someone like andy verity comes along and starts poking his nose in and then suddenly mervyn king's appointing lawyers um because he's worried about his position you know Crikey, it's remarkable. Really, it's remarkable. You've mentioned the Treasury Select Committee a couple of times, Tom. So, um, based upon what I heard on the lowball tapes, it seems to me that the first time they looked at this matter, they simply weren't given all the information. If they were, they would have probably come to very different conclusions and thought completely differently about the whole thing. To, to your mind, Tom, is there any sensible reason why the Treasury Select Committee should not now enthusiastically pick this whole thing up again and look at it properly they need to look at the whole thing they need to look at the the way the prosecutions were handled too they need to look at you know how the decisions were reached to create this criminal offense in this country when it isn't criminal anywhere else they need i mean it needs to be a broad mandate and unfortunately there's meant to be a separation between politics and justice and the judiciary but i think that line was very badly blurred and crossed in the libel cases um and you know do they have the remit to actually look at the way the justice was was served i mean i'll, I'll give you another example david green the former director of the series Ford office went to answer questions to the justice select committee the committee of its own volition asked him about the expert that gave evidence in my case because it had just been discovered that he wasn't an expert. David Green 
demurred and didn't want to answer that question because he said they were in the middle of an appeal which was going on which was another defendant which is true and uh, he later provided a written response and he said that the expert lacked integrity he said that the sfo had no knowledge of his lack of expertise he made material misrepresentations now they were effectively lies and they were one or two things. So either negligence, because he didn't know what was going on inside his own for own, own organization. Yeah. Or worse, you know, he, he knowingly misled them. Um, and I felt very strongly that the Metropolitan Police, when we asked them to investigate the expert, had declined to prosecute him for fraud by false misrepresentation because they said, to quote, the prosecution were aware of his level of expertise, i.e. lack of it. Um, something that the CCRC have managed to, again, find the completely opposite conclusion. Um, and obviously, we had the email evidence to show that they knew he wasn't an expert. In fact, the first person who responded to one of his early requests to have his report checked for howlers said, we don't think you should be giving evidence about things that you're not an expert in or, or, or with, out with your expertise. And they were overruled by the Q prosecution QC in the case. Who said it was just having his report um, peer reviewed, which right. obviously wasn't true. So I objected to the Justice Select Committee and I said, you've been misled by omission um, and you need to recall David Green to explain why he hasn't told you that they were aware that this expert wasn't an expert. But who am I writing to? I'm writing to Bob O'Neill. Bob O'Neill at the start of that hearing, when he's questioning David Green, has to make a series of declarations declarations of his professional and personal friendship with David Green. So well, what chance do I have? And I'm shut off by the Justice Select Committee. They don't even want to talk to me. They don't want to consider what I'm saying. They've got no interest in what I'm telling them. You know, and then I have this bizarre situation where on one hand, I have the special inquiry team in the Metropolitan Police saying, oh, we can't prosecute Mr. Hayden Rowe because he told them he wasn't an expert. And then on the other hand, I've got the CCRC saying, well, the SFO had no idea that he wasn't an expert, despite the fact that he'd written to them and said, can I have my report checked for howlers? And it's good to have a specialist to look at it. Um, you know, and the language is clear because the first guy who read it said, I don't think you should be giving evidence. That was Stuart Alford. And he was he was the honest one. But he was overruled by the prosecuting QC in my case, Michael Charla. Um, so, you know, and how the CCRC, again, have reached that conclusion when the Metropolitan Police have reached the complete opposite conclusion is beyond me. Mm. And it's, you know, I don't want to go, I don't want to complain too much about the CCRC decision, but because I'm still in front of them, you know, and I obviously have to be wary of, you know, basically, you know, being too confrontational because they still could refer me following our all representations that are going to take place. Um, but again, it was a set of decisions that made no sense to me. Tom, thank you. Um, if, and it's, a, it's an if, it's a real if, if the Treasury Select Committee were to invite you to talk to them and to share your thoughts, insights, experience about what's happened, uh, what would your response be to that invitation? I'd bite their hands off. I mean, I'm quite happy to answer difficult questions about my own conduct as well, because I, you know, I was, you know, I made a thousand requests or something crazy. I, I mean, I really was someone who would make a request every day, the same request every day. I'd send an email to the guy sitting next to me. Um, you know, so I know I made lots of requests. It's just because, maybe because of my Asperger's or whatever, I'm just a bit obsessive and, you know, like, it would just be like, I would, I would think, oh, well, I have to tell them every day because they're going to forget. Um, you know, I behaved in a manner that was completely inconsistent with someone who thought he was committing an international fraud. Yeah, that's right. It would, it would have been the most transparent crime ever you know um you you went about things in such a transparent way it, it's to me personally it's just obvious uh, you didn't think you were doing something that was in any way um inappropriate given the fact that it was all happening around you anyway and it's also equally obvious to me tom and i'm sure many many other people who've who've listened to the the, the lowball tapes that the people who should be getting investigated and potentially prosecuted haven't been uh, and um, even though it's many many years on uh, surely surely the fundamental integrity of the system matters enough 
to look back at what happened now and to try to put things right. Um, the Transparency Task Force will do whatever we can to try to encourage the idea that the Treasury Select Committee ought to uh, take another look at this case and to interview and other relevant people. Tom, in, in, in winding this conversation up, can I just please thank you, you know, person to person, man to man, as it were, I, I genuinely find you to be a remarkably open and straightforward person to talk to about such, uh, you know, difficult and complicated matters. You've been, you've been phenomenally open with me. I, I really do salute you for being that way. But more, more than anything else, you said something earlier about, you know, not judging somebody until you've walked in their shoes. Um, I think of myself as a pretty resilient, tough individual with a lot of, you know, stamina and backbone. I just do not know how you managed to cope under the uh, immense pressure and challenges and strains that you've experienced in your life. You know, being sent to jail, knowing that you shouldn't be there, it must have just, but beyond words, Tom, beyond words, I have nothing but pure admiration for you, Tom, I really have. Thank you so, so much for sharing time with me today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. That's no problem at all. It was nice to talk to you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody's reaction to that is is exactly as mine was. It's just it's just mind blowingly powerful stuff. Um, we got a lot of work on our hands, haven't we? We really do have a hell of a lot of work on our hands. The, the system is 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 even worse, even worse than uh, many of us, most of us, all of us uh, could have could have imagined. Before we do anything else, can we please show our appreciation to Tom for that? Because that was just remarkable. Tom Hayes, thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very, very much indeed. Uh, and Tom, if you if you wish to, please do take yourself off mute and just say any 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 follow up words, if any that you'd like to share. It's entirely down to you, Tom, whether you want to do that or not. So, yeah, no, I just wanted to say that all too often the uh, the pain and the suffering is always focused on me because of the length of the sentence I've got. And I actually feel some guilt about that um, because it hurts so many people, including people who never even went to prison. Um, so it's really important to bear those other people in your mind during this whole process, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic and globally, you know, where they the wrong people have been sent to prison um, and or not sent to prison, as the case may be. But I mean, this is far bigger than just me. And it frustrates me that sometimes, you know, my name becomes synonymous with it. Um, at the expense of others so it's really great today that Carlo and Jay were able to talk a bit um, about how it affected them too so um, anyway that's just what I'd like to say thank you. Tom, Tom Hayes we, we salute you we really do salute you um, we're uh, we're going to go back to the previous speakers just to see if they've had anything else that they'd like to share before we start bringing this session to uh, to a close but I, I promise you everybody this is not a an event in isolation. We are going to continue to try to uh, build momentum and snowball the lowball tapes into real meaningful change. Um, and I, I really challenge anybody to think of any good reason why we shouldn't try our absolute hardest to to try to make a difference. Is Matt Connolly still with us? Um, if Matt is, he may well not be. But if Matt is, please, Matt, now is a chance to share any further thoughts that you might have. I think Matt. Uh I am still here, and uh, I think we covered it all. Um, and I just want to thank everybody, including yourself, Andy Verity, the traders who spoke, the people who still care after all these years. Um, you know, I really do think all the scandals in the UK banking, uh, including the SME scandals and interest rate hedging and restructuring, asset stripping, everything else, it's all related. Yeah. All, all these issues are related because it, it's a dysfunctional, um, dysfunctional way of doing business. Uh, there's a lot of cover-ups. Uh, there's the revolving door between the regulators going to banks, then going into government and how they work together in the UK. Um, you know, so I continue to think it's it's all related you know people people want to pit you know the sme people against the bankers 
And in our case, we are all victims of the same, you know, kind of dysfunctional cycle, you know, and that's what we need to change. Thank you very much indeed, Matt. Thank you. I think you're absolutely right. It is all interconnected. It is all interconnected. Um, to fix the system, we have to fix the whole system. It, it's clear that we do have to do that. Thank you very much again for being with us, Matt. Can, can we now go to Can we now go to Jay? Jay, any further thoughts from yourself, please? Um, uh, firstly, I think Matt's right. We did cover most of the points, um, and in, on that aspect, we're all right. But more importantly, I just want to say thank you to all of you all for listening and caring. There's not mean much hope and optimism in my life in the last 12 years, but after this call, I do have a bit of hope and optimism. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jay. Those are very kind words to say. Thank you very much. Carlo, please share your thoughts. Not much more to say, just like Jay said, thank you very much for caring. Um, thank let's you. open a better world. Thank you, Carlo. Let's, 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 let's work at it. Mr. Paul Collier? No, I just think you know, what we need to use this event today as is a platform. This isn't the end of it. This yep. should be the start of a new part of the process, a new chapter, if you like, to make sure that justice is done. And not just for all the guys that have shared their stories tonight, but as Tom said, all those that others that have been affected and all the other consequential damages that have uh, been suffered by UK um, business customers and, and just ordinary men on the street. Thank you, Paul. You really have helped me to... Um... Um, see the bigger picture today in relation to the the significance of those um, compromising photos as, as it were that the hold that the system that, that would have been had on the system over the last 10 years is is damn obvious we'll, we'll jump back to tom just in case tom has anything else to say tom any final points from yourself no 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 thanks for listening to those who managed to bear with us through the whole thing including my very elongated interview i apologize um anyway i hope it was interesting for you it was it was it was um ladies and gentlemen we'll wrap it up there um just a statement of commitment from ttf and myself personally we're going to do all we can if anybody is inclined to try to help us with that about how to think up through our strategy the best things to do the right order in which to do them please let us know we'll circulate the notes tomorrow and we'll invite everybody to be part of the uh, working party, for want of a better phrase, to drive the Low Ball Snowball project further forward. Uh, this is really, really meaningful work. If you're looking for something with meaning and purpose, this is it. You know, we could potentially make a difference here. And even if we only make a little bit of a difference, it might be the little difference that makes the big difference. And um, I know I'm repeating myself from what I said earlier, I, I don't want my kids growing up in a corrupt world. It is as simple as that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. We'll bow out now. Thank you. Bye-bye.